Ah, <sighs> what a fine day for mystery solving. Time to get the gang back together. All right, gang, time to solve more mysteries. We're going to have so much fun together. Shut up. We're not the mystery gang, Greg. Stop making us play pretend. Shut up. You couldn't possibly know my pain. I must recapture my youth because it has been taken from me. What do you mean, Greg? Oh, Scooby-Doo, my beloved Scooby-Doo. A series I've had many good memories with. Seeing the Scooby-Doo gang solving mystery after mystery, the memes, oh, the memes. My beloved Ultra Instinct Shaggy. Indeed, you are superior to even the likes of Goku and the many debates, like is Velma a lesbian or is she bisexual? It's nothing but good memories. Until the Hollywood Corporation got their hands on him. <laughs> And now, my youth is under attack, in ways I could have never imagined. But I will not let them get away with this. I will give them true pain, even if it costs me my life. So, are you with me, gang? Fuck you, Greg. I'm leaving. <laughs> Fine. If I can't exact on my revenge, I'll just watch a YouTuber talk about the show instead. You've got mail. Huh? In the Western world, it feels like there's just so much division between people. The culture war feels like it's everywhere nowadays, and as time has gone on, it feels more and more inescapable. At times, it may feel like people on the left and the right can't agree on, well, anything. But every now and then, there's someone or something that is just so terrible that the left and the right put aside their differences and agree to hate it together. Whether it's Daft Noodles, Lily Orchard, Kongay West, and of course, the subject for today's video, Velma. Now I promised you guys that if my Velma video got 7k likes, that I would do a full review of the entire series. In retrospect, I really should have asked for more because I did not want to review this series. I could tell just from the first episode that this would easily be the worst series I've ever reviewed. And that's coming from a guy who reviewed all of She-Hulk, Kenobi, and Twilight. I said that She-Hulk felt like a show that was just designed to piss people off. But I wish I didn't say that because Velma definitely deserves that description way more. It was expected for people on the right to hate this show, but even people on the left hated it. No one had any idea who this show was made for, but now that it's been out for a year, I think it's a good time to look back on it. But before I begin, I want to debunk the rumor that this show became successful because of hate watching. I talked about this in detail in a different video, so if you want more information, go check that out. But to sum it up, the article that everybody loves to point to said that it's Premiere was the most watched thing on HBO Max. And even then, it was only the most watched animated and animated original show. Hey guys, we found the strongest man in the world, and we know he's the strongest man in the world because for one day, he was the strongest man in the world while standing on top of a raft and wearing a sombrero. Now, my first Velma video, I already talked about the trailer, so let's skip straight to episode one. And yes, I also reviewed episode one in my first Velma video. But this time, I'm gonna go and into much greater detail. Episode 1 starts off with Velma saying that this is her origin story. Put a pin in this because we'll see just how well this works as an origin story for Velma. First of all, her race is completely wrong and no, she doesn't become a white girl at the end of the season. And as you guys are well aware, Scooby-Doo, you know, the star of the Scooby-Doo show, never shows up in this show at all. That would be like making the Mario movie without having Mario in it. Then she says that origin stories are usually about tall, handsome, 
guy struggling with the burden of being handed more power. Now from my experience, origin stories are normally about poor losers who, yes, normally do look attractive, but they don't struggle with the burden of having power. They struggle with the burden of responsibility that that power gives them. After all, with great power comes great responsibility. Responsibility being something that Velma completely lacks. Then she says, and if they are about girls, it's usually like, hey, what made this hot girl go crazy? Um, aside from Harley Quinn, what show about a girl has that premise? She-Hulk didn't have that premise. Twilight didn't have that premise. Witcher Blood Origin or Ahsoka didn't have that premise. This is just a made-up problem. But there is one show aside from Harley Quinn where I asked this question. This show! Yeah, throughout this show I was asking myself, why is Velma such a crazy bitch? And we find out later it's because her mom left her and she was also hypnotized or something. Oh no, wait, I'm wrong. Velma does not fall in this category because she was talking about hot girls. Yeah, I talked about this in my video, Is Race Bending Making People More Racist? And in that video I brought up how the worst version of Velma is the one that they race bent. Like imagine if I made a race bent version of myself and he was like, yo man, it's me, Jamaican Jaw. I'm gonna eat this baby. Then she goes on to say that she was the one who assembled the Mystery Inc. team and not Fred. You is a motherfucker, you know? Oh my god, it's like Batwoman. Uh, it turns out this whole time, a man was actually taking credit for a woman's work. We cut to a bunch of 15-year-old girls showering together. A lot of people freaked out about this, but come on, I've seen what animes you guys watch. Honestly, this is pretty tame compared to half of them. Two cockroaches start banging. Apparently, this is supposed to be funny or something. Fun fact, did you know that all cockroaches are intersex? Penis. And they decide which one will carry the baby by fighting, whoever wins wins is the dad, and whoever loses is the mom. Yeah, make an anime around that premise. Oh, who am I kidding? I'm pretty sure that already exists. Daphne, who is, uh, Asian, by the way. Like, I'm not saying that Asian gingers don't exist, but they're insanely rare. Hell, even white gingers are pretty rare. Believe it or not, one time I saw a black ginger with blue eyes. There's gotta be only, like, a dozen of those in the world. His nickname was Ganon, by the way. Wait, what was I talking about? Shit! Oh yeah, Daphne says to one of the other girls, Have you ever noticed that pilots for TV shows normally have a lot more sex and nudity than the rest of the series? And while that is something I have noticed, and this is a pretty subtle fourth wall joke, it isn't funny. It's just above, hey look, reference. Velma comes into the shower room, role-playing as Gordon Freeman. She of course assaults people, and asks Daphne, How do you feel about race-blind casting? Which, by the way, is the practice of casting without considering the actor's ethnicity or race. Now, I'm one of those people who likes it when, you know, the actor looks That's like the amazing. character they're playing. I guess that makes me a racist or something. And in animation, this is even easier because characters can be, well, any ethnicity you draw them as. Daphne is voiced by an Asian woman, and she's Asian in the show. Velma is voiced by a South Asian woman, and that's what she is in the show. Basically, I'm trying to say that this show was not made through blind casting. The casting was very deliberate. Daphne says that as an Asian woman, she thinks it would be cool because she would get more job opportunities. Uh, okay, there's a very good reason as to why there's not a lot of Asian actors and actresses in Hollywood. It's for the exact same reason why you don't see a lot of Asians working at McDonald's or working construction. It's because there's very few Asians in America. Hey, there's not a lot of Native American actors in Bollywood. Well, maybe it's because there's very few Native Americans who live in India. Which is very ironic when you think about it. Velma says that she wasn't expecting such an enlightened answer. Well, I wouldn't expect you to. You attacked her! We get to another joke from the second trailer where a dead girl falls out of a locker wow. and she has no brain. Velma points this out, but she's not dissing her, she literally has no brain. Ha ha, what a knee slapper. And I'm pretty sure the inspiration for this joke came from one of the writers on this show. We see the title screen and I won't lie, it's very beautifully animated. Velma is of course a suspect for the murder. I mean, she did come into the locker room with a fucking crowbar. I've played Half-Life, I know the damage those things can do. She's being interrogated by two interracial lesbian cops. And the cops... Ugh. 
Tell Velma that she will be arrested for murder unless she can prove who did it within 24 hours. Yeah, I don't think I need to tell any of you, that's not how murder investigations work. <clears throat> oh yeah, and this is our first introduction to Velma's schizophrenic visions. We'll get to that more later on, but you won't believe how bad the payoff is. Anyways, Velma, the 15-year-old girl, is off to solve a murder case. She checks her phone and sees a bunch of missed messages from Norvell. And yes, I am a aware that Norvell is Shaggy's real name. In this show, they basically make him a giant simp for Velma. I guess they're doing a role reversal because in the original Scooby-Doo shows, a lot of people simped for Shaggy. Velma is about to call Norvell so he can help her, but she bumps into the rich, evil, racist, bigoted Fred, and she completely falls head over heels for him. God, I hate Andrew Tate so much, but he's so dreamy. Daphne and Fred start making out and Daphne sexually assaults Fred. Like, he's clearly not into it and she's trying to force herself onto him. I guess it's okay when women do it in shows. Velma goes back home to her family who, for some reason, speak in hashtags. Um, writers, I know you guys are old and out of touch, but, uh, Gen Zers don't actually talk like this. This is one of the biggest how-do-you-do fellow kids I've seen in a very long time. Velma's lawyer dad, of course, knocked up a Latina racist. <laughs> I meant to write waitress in the script, I swear. And she gets naked and the baby is fully visible in her stomach. Yeah, I'm pretty sure one of the writers for Big Mouth worked on this show. Um, to any South Asian or Latina people in my audience, do you guys consider this to be good representation? At the wake of the girl who was murdered, someone says, Often in pop culture, we see a slutty girl get murdered and we think to ourselves, well, maybe she deserved it. Yep, this show couldn't go five minutes without making another fourth wall joke. My god, this really is a worse version of She-Hulk. Velma is hallucinating in an alleyway, saying, You're not real, you're not real. But then Fred comes out from behind a dumpster and says, I am real, a real man, father. What? Wow, what natural dialogue. It turns out that Fred is insecure about his masculinity, and he wants to be a manly man like his father, the same father who puts his cigars out on him. You see, toxic masculinity is taught, but we must unlearn it. Velma tells Fred that his story is cool and all, but her story is much more important. It turns out one night during Christmas, Velma's mom left to get some milk or cigarettes or something, and never came back. <coughs> her car was found with her glasses and a wrapped present. So Velma... <coughs> decides that she'll put on her mom's glasses and not open the present until she found her. You know, Velma, that present could be a possible clue. <laughs> I'm also shocked that the cops didn't keep it for evidence. Norvell shows up and says that he got worried because Velma wasn't responding to his, uh, VMs, which stand for voicemails. Yep, this is yet another how do you do, fellow kids. He's a complete simp for Velma, and even though he doesn't look like Shaggy nor act like Shaggy, he's supposed to be Shaggy. Velma also treats him like complete garbage. She tells him that she doesn't want to do math homework with him. She just wants him to email her his answers like he's always done. I'll give the writers credit for one thing. They made a very accurate interpretation of a simp. Also, I thought Velma was a smart one, so why would she need help with her homework? Velma goes home and for the first time in her life, she realizes that she's a terrible person. And that's probably why her mom left. But she's not going to try to grow as a person or feel guilty about it, she's just gonna move on with her life. You know, I know that Velma is supposed to be a self-insert for a Hollywood actress, but uh, I didn't expect Mindy Callie to be this honest about herself. Also, it's kind of weird that Velma comes to the realization that her mom probably left because she was terrible, and not because she was kidnapped or anything, and for some reason this makes Velma feel better about herself? Velma throws away the present that was in her mom's car, even though it could be a clue that could lead to her location. And then eats a fry out of the garbage. <laughs> yeah, this is the weirdest self-insert character I've ever seen in my life. Velma goes to school the next day after giving herself a makeover, which makes her actually look attractive. Uh, and we get to the cringiest line in this episode. Some fat white guy says, Are you a foreign exchange student from a more sexually liberated country? Bro, what are you talking about? America is one of the most sexually liberated countries in the world. And Velma is sexy now because... 
she is unburdened by the belief that she made her mother go missing? What? That's the complete opposite of what happened! Yep, the writers just forgot what they just wrote. Honestly, I'm surprised it took this long. Everybody starts throwing stuff at Velma because she's a terrible person. And then somehow Fred throws something which cuts off this guy's leg. Velma goes into the bathroom to wash herself off, and we get to probably the most dragged out toilet joke I've ever heard in my life. Daphne is trying to tell Velma something, and someone keeps interrupting her by flushing. With how much time is devoted to this joke, I bet the writers are super proud of it. I'm not exaggerating, this joke goes on for like 30 seconds. Velma jumps to the conclusion that Fred is the murderer because he's a rich white guy. Velma sneaks into Fred's mansion and starts having another hallucination, but Norvell breaks her out of it by telling her that he loves her, and then she immediately Fred zones him. Fred comes in in a robe in a pair Apparently, he hasn't gone through puberty yet, so his balls haven't dropped and he has a small pee-pee. He starts walking towards Velma like he's gonna stab her, and then the two lesbian cops come in at the most convenient time and shoot him in the legs. Yep, everyone, it's another super convenient thing that happened for the plot to move forward. Honestly, I'm shocked that it didn't happen sooner in this episode. And by the way, Fred wasn't gonna stab her, he was just gonna pay her off. Like, the cops have no reason to suspect him, but they still arrest him after shooting him. The episode ends with Velma going home, and she finds another murder victim in her trash can. Well, if the police already suspected Velma to be the murderer before, now they have even more reason to. So that was episode one, and I gotta be honest, so far, this is not the worst show I've ever reviewed. Oh, don't get me wrong, it's bad, but I've reviewed much worse shows than this. So let's move on to episode two. Episode 2 of Velma starts off right where episode 1 ended, with Fred being dragged away by the cops. Yep, he was shot in both legs and now he's gonna be tried for murder because a brown girl said he did it. Well, if that's not white privilege, then I don't know what it is. Oh, and if you didn't remember that Fred had a tiny dong from the last episode, don't worry, cause they do another joke about it right at the start of the episode. Now keep in mind Velma, Mindy Kelly's self-insert, is attracted to Fred, a racist, bigoted rich white guy with a tiny penis. Ooh, that's kind of small. Yikes. I don't know, maybe Mindy Kelly is trying to tell us something. Also, it does amaze me how much the writers are talking about a 15-year-old's dick size. Velma's lawyer dad is going to be defending Fred in court. He explains to his daughter that there's a chance that he could be innocent, but she tells her dad that she knows he did it because he's a white guy? Yeah, whenever a crime is committed, people always assume that a rich white guy did it. That's white privilege 101. By the way, She-Hulk was the worst show I ever reviewed that had a lawyer in it, but something tells me that the writers for Velma will have even less understanding of how the law works. By the way, it's later revealed that Fred didn't do it, so Velma was just being racist for no reason. Velma decides to go find her missing mother, even though it was established in the previous episode that her mother left them, she's not missing, but modern Hollywood writers tend to forget what they just wrote, so I'm not surprised. Velma goes back to school with Norville and, uh, we get to the cringy joke from the trailer about how 420 stands for adults who still watch cartoons. Velma walks up to Daphne and we get a knee slapper of a joke. Daphne says to Velma that she knows she thinks that she ditched her to be cool. Velma says that's not true, but then we see graffiti saying the opposite. Yeah, the whole joke of a character saying, I'm not gonna do something and then they do it or already did did it. May have been funny the first 500 times, but now it's really overplayed its welcome. Velma then says to Daphne, I give my sincerest condolences for the loss of your more popular friends that you picked over me. Velma, they were murdered. What's wrong with you? Like most super villains wouldn't even say something like that. Ha ha, your friends died. Serves you right for picking them over me. This is only episode two and Velma is already one of the most unlikable main characters I have ever seen. And the fact that she's a self-insert for Mindy Kelly, that's concerning. So right after Velma said something really horrible to Daphne, she tries to manipulate her by using their past friendship. Ha oh, ha, your friend 
friends died, but since we used to be friends, can you do something for me? Thelma wants Daphne to get her court case files from the two lesbian police officers, who turn out to be Daphne's adopted mothers. Okay, first of all, this is a super convenient thing that happened for the plot to move forward. The chances that Velma used to be friends with someone who is the daughter of the two police officers working on Fred's case are pretty small. But the bigger problem is police officers don't bring court documents home with them. They keep them at a courthouse or a police station. So yeah, they haven't even gotten to court yet. And already the writers of She-Hulk have proven that they know more about the law than the writers of Velma. Something super convenient happened for the plot to move forward and it doesn't even make sense. Daphne agrees to give Velma the files on one condition. She has to pay her $500. Wow, I am happy that Velma isn't immediately getting what she wanted after she was a terrible person. We cut to Fred and his family. And Fred says, ugh. The only reason why people think I killed those girls is because I basically confessed to it. Um, what? No, Fred didn't do that. He was offering to pay off Velma. This was at the end of the last episode. How do the writers not remember this? Also, even if he did confess to this crime, with how he did it, it would have been considered entrapment. And also, the cops were in his home without a warrant. Earlier in the episode, Velma's lawyer dad said that he's going to use Fred's tiny dick to win this case. I'm not a lawyer, and I know that searching someone's home without a warrant and using entrapment to gain a confession would be much better things to use in court than your client's tiny penis or dressing him up as a innocent little boy. You know, I said it before, but I'm confident about it now. The writers of Velma know less about the law than the writers of She-Hulk. And of course, Fred is such a useless white male that he doesn't even know how to cut his own food. I gotta be honest, this might be the most pathetic straw man of people the writers don't like. Like, even back when people were super racist in America, they didn't do things like, black people are so incompetent that they don't even know how to cut meat. Don't get me wrong, they did say a lot of racist shit, but I don't think they went as far as to do something like that. Also, calm down, Twitter. I'm not trying to say that modern-day white men are treated even worse than black people 150 years ago. Also, for the love of God, please don't take that quote out of context. I'm just trying to say that this is such an extreme straw man. And believe it or not, Fred not being able to feed himself is actually a plot point. No, I'm not joking. But I will say one good thing about this show. Fred's dad being voiced by the OG voice actor for Fred is fantastic casting. We cut back to Velma who's trying to steal from Norvell's family to get the $500? Mindy Kelly just wants herself insert to be the most unlikable main character ever. Oh yeah, and there's a subplot about the two lesbian cops going undercover in a school to catch a drug dealer. And they do things like wearing their hat backwards and dabbing. I get that the writers are trying to tell us that these are old out of touch people, but the writers are still even more out of touch than this. Remember in episode one when people were talking in hashtags? Imagine being even dumber than your straw man. Velma goes into Norvell's room. He's in the middle of streaming. Chat, like, you, you don't even have to even, like, put, put together, you know, like, like, what, this is crazy, chat, you know, like, it, it's, it's crazy, you know, like. He starts sipping for her, and because he's a simp, a lot of people leave his chat and unsubscribe. I gotta be honest, this is a pretty realistic portrayal of how streaming works. And Norvell says the worst line in the episode. In teen movies, a guy will sell something to get money to blackmail a girl into dating him for it. He says it's problematic, but effective and hilarious? I and many people have asked this question. Has that happened in like any movie? Like if anyone can send me a clip from a teen movie where a guy blackmails a girl into dating him, that would be greatly appreciated. But as far as I'm aware, this is a completely made a problem. This is one of the biggest problems with the Velma show. It's trying to talk about social issues that don't exist. Maybe in an alternate dimension, this is a really good show, but not in this dimension. Like I'm half expecting this show to say, don't you hate it how in superhero movies the villain is always from South America? But again, I haven't seen every movie ever, so maybe I'm wrong. So because Velma can't get the $500, Daphne for some reason tries to hire her. Why would you try to hire Velma? She's completely incompetent at everything. Oh wait, she's a self-insert from Mindy Kelly, and she's incompetent at everything, but people keep hiring her. It turns out that Daphne is actually the drug dealer that her adopted mother
mothers are looking for. Thelma says, <gasps> You're the candy man? And Daphne tells her that she's the candy woman. Now this is one of the most annoying things that progressives have done with the English language. It's not policeman, it's police person. It's not fireman, it's firefighter. It's not mailman, it's male person. By the way, one time I dated a male lady and I found out later that she really was a male lady. But in all seriousness, the word man can be short for human. I mean, after all, you can't spell woman without man. Daphne also says that according to TV, it's morally okay to sell drugs if your life is kind of bad. Breaking Bad is the most popular show about a drug dealer. And throughout the show, they made it clear that what he was doing was morally bad. Like, even if these jokes work, they would only be as funny as, hey, look, reference. But they can't even do that right. They're making references to things that don't exist. This show feels like it was written by primitive AI from an alien planet. Velma, ugh says that those are all white people, Daphne. Minorities on TV can only sell drugs to escape poverty. First of all, again, Walter White was white. His actions were never painted as morally good. Second, minorities in TV shows don't just sell drugs to escape poverty. Often they're like a drug lord or something, like Gus. Yeah, characters in TV shows, not just minorities, but white people as well, often do sell drugs to escape poverty, but that's not always the only reason and why they do it. This show has to have been made in an alternate dimension, I swear. By the way, Velma is such a massively racist character. Like, by the actual definition, she's racist. Daphne says that Velma knows everything about everyone. Um, no, she doesn't. She's an idiot that jumps to conclusions and needs her friend to give her the answers for her math homework. Velma literally hasn't done a single smart thing throughout this entire show. Oh yeah, there's also another side plot of Norvell trying to sell his sword to raise the $500 to get Velma to date him. There's some very subtle foreshadowing of a guy whose bounty is at exactly $500, and I think at one point he contemplates selling his kidney for the money. Yeah, I think this guy might be the biggest simp in media. Velma is going around selling drugs, some white girl calls her a dork, and um, Velma retorts by calling her a uh, white girl with too much money. Woof, what a good insult, telling people that they have too much money. Daphne tells Velma that she knows she's a genius. She's not a genius, she's a complete idiot. She literally eats out of the trash. Also later, Daphne fires Velma because she's too stupid to sell dope. We finally get to the court case and there's, oh my God, at least three people with signs that all say, lock her up, but instead of her, this time we mean him. Okay, this legitimately made me angry. It's implying that women get Get locked up more often or for longer than men, and that could not be further from the truth. While it is true that men do commit more crime than women, men are still much more likely to get convicted and be locked up for longer periods of time than women. In fact, last time I checked, the jail time served between men and women is six times greater than the jail time served between white and black people. One of my favorite gotcha moments to play on liberals is I would ask them, hey, do you think it's wrong that black people serve more jail time than white people, and they would be like, yes, and then I would bring up that the gender difference between men and women was six times greater, and they would look for any excuse as to why that's okay. But yeah, this uh, commentary on society is not just wrong, it's the opposite of reality. World ends, women most affected. Fred shows up dressed as, um, a Shoda. The reporter says that she speaks for the entire journalistic community when she's says, I feel like an asshole. Okay, you know what, Mindy Kelly, that was actually a good joke. But then it starts raining, and this causes Fred to look like Hitler. Of course, someone points this out and says he looks like Hitler, but then he actually says something kind of funny by saying, and not just because we compare everyone to Hitler these days. Okay, I will say one good thing about this show that it has over She-Hulk. The jokes are a lot better. Granted, that's not a high bar Whoa. to jump over, but they jumped over it. We cut back to Daphne and Velma, and Daphne wonders as to why her hair is the color of buffalo wings. Huh, 
huh, maybe they'll actually answer why her hair is that color in this show. But let's not get our hopes up. Daphne and Velma share a tender moment. But then the cops show up and start chasing them. The chase ends with the cops, oh my god, running over a baby? Okay, it does survive, but man, that would have been such a dark turn. A little later on, Velma tries to sell drugs to this one guy, but it's actually her dad. And then he offers his daughter the $500 for the file if she can help him prove Fred's innocence. I don't know why any lawyer would ask their idiot daughter for help proving someone's innocence. Maybe he just really wants to lose the case. Velma looks through the case file and determines that, yep, Fred is guilty. But then she notices that Fred is such a man baby that he can't cut his own food, and then she finally realizes that he couldn't have been the one to do it. In court, instead of, uh, Velma swearing on the Holy Bible, she swears on a copy of Grey's Anatomy. Well, actually it's Gurr's Anna because, well, uh, the animators didn't finish animating the rest of the words. Look, she took her hand off of it, you can clearly see it. Boy, I really hope somebody got fired for that blunder. She then proves Fred's innocence by showing the court that he's a big man baby with a tiny dog who doesn't even know how to cut a steak. They put a steak in front of him and, uh, Fred is so retarded that he holds the knife and fork upside down and also tries to cut it with a plate. Okay, calling him retarded is a little mean because even people with literal Down syndrome would be smarter than this. Like this would not fly in court, no judge would fall for this because no one would actually be this stupid. Does anybody find this funny? I mean, Velma isn't age appropriate for five-year-olds and I think only five-year-olds would laugh at a joke like this. The punchline is just, look at how incompetent competent white men are, but it's too cartoonishly over the top to be offensive. Someone on the jury says he's just like a little boy. Bro, not even little boys are this stupid. Thelma's dad says to the jury, how can someone who can't even cut a steak remove the brains of two girls? I don't know, maybe he's faking it. No one could be this stupid, or even stupid enough to fall for something like this. Yep, the characters in Velma are more stupid than the characters in Kenobi and Ahsoka combined. But because Fred is full of so much toxic masculinity, he tries to reclaim his masculinity by saying he really did kill those two girls. The episode ends with Velma going home, she starts suffering another panic attack, and Daphne gets her out of it by kissing her without her consent. Now apparently it was a really big deal that Velma was lesbian in this show, even though she's been a lesbian before. But I guess Daphne hasn't, so I guess that's something new. And that's the end of episode two. Okay, I didn't think episode one was that bad, but my god, I see why people say this is the worst show ever now. Episode one was bad, don't get me wrong, but it wasn't the worst first episode of any show I've ever seen. But episode two of Velma is the worst episode I've seen of any show ever. But there's eight episodes left, so something tells me I haven't seen the worst episode of Velma yet. Anyways, let's move on to episode three. Hopefully it's better than this one. Hey everyone, I'm using a different laptop to record, tell me if it makes my voice sound better or worse. Anyways, episode 3 of Velma begins right where episode 2 ended, with Velma and Daphne making out. Daphne decides to go home and Velma says, what the hell just happened? Which is exactly what I say after watching any episode of Velma. Velma is so shocked from the kiss that it puts her in a daze. She can't sleep, and when she's getting ready for school, she uh, pours coffee and cereal and puts her hand in the toaster. Now this is a very common joke that is relatable to to, well, everyone. Sometimes you're just so shocked or tired that you get things mixed up. I remember I was so tired one time that I put the dishes in the bathtub and the baby in the sink. Needless to say, I got fired from babysitting for that family. But this joke only works if, you know, things are mixed up. Like if she was buttering her cereal and pouring milk onto her toast. You flip them around and she's pouring milk into her cereal and buttering her toast. If you flip around what she's doing, she would be pouring coffee into her toaster and putting her hand in a bowl of cereal? Oh, and um, for some reason the toaster shocks her. Velma narrates to the audience that the only thing people want to know about her character, is she gay or not? I mean, it really just depends on the continuity. She's been into Johnny Bravo and Shaggy, and she's also been a lesbian before. Yeah, I know this show is trying to act like it's the first one to ever make Velma bisexual, but it's been done before. Oh yeah, and apparently while Velma was in her days, she accidentally fed the cat prenatal vitamins. I bring this up only so I can make a bad joke. That's one hairy pussy. 
Yeah, I made that joke up on the spot and it's already funnier than, well, whatever this is supposed to be. Velma goes to school and meets up with Norvell. She tells him what happened and he tells Velma that her possibly being gay is a huge deal, even though we see two guys constantly making out in the background. But now that Velma got the court case files from the last episode, she now knows the last place her mom's phone pinged was at Fred's house. Oh boy, Velma, are you gonna falsely accuse him of murder again? We get to the one joke from the trailer that actually made me laugh where Velma says, you can't speculate about someone's sexuality unless they're famous or peppermint patty. Not gonna lie, even now this joke genuinely makes me laugh. <laughs> we learn that Norvell's dad is a therapist and um, yeah, considering his son is friends with Velma, he needs all the therapy he can get. Velma says that Shaggy's dad is just a school therapist, the lowest form of therapist there is. He's even worse than her therapy app, which is obviously Russian spyware. Oh yeah, this came out before the war with Ukraine. Remember how a whole bunch of people on the left kept on going on and on about how Trump only won because of Russian hackers? And how the right was going on and on about how Hillary wanted no fly zone over Syria, which could start a war with Russia? Yeah, both sides were way too scared of Russia back then. Now we know they can't even take over a small nation. Velma, along with the rest of the girls in the school, have to take a uh, women's self-defense class so they don't get murdered. Velma says, why don't boys take a don't murder women class. Norvell's mom says back to Velma, because I only have $50 in the budget to combat centuries of toxic masculinity. Okay, so the term toxic masculinity is a lot like the term wokeness. It's very hard to define and everyone seems to have their own definition for it. So just like with the term wokeness, if you're going to argue against toxic masculinity, you need to figure out what the person you're arguing with defines it as. This show seems to define it as men thinking it's okay to murder women because that's what they've been taught for hundreds of years? Well, that's just stupid. Murder has been illegal for hundreds of years in just about every single country. If anything, there's a surprising amount of women who are into serial killers, so wouldn't this be toxic femininity? And obviously, Velma saying don't teach women to defend themselves, teach men not to murder, is obviously in reference to the popular talking point, don't teach women how to avoid being raped, just teach men not to rape. Now obviously, this talking point has been torn to shreds, especially on YouTube during 2016. Men already know it's illegal. They could get arrested for doing it. And just merely being accused of wipe can completely destroy someone's social standing. They already know it's wrong. They just don't care. Or they're just currently under the influence of something. I completely support the idea of women taking self-defense courses. This talking point is as stupid as saying, don't teach me to lock my door when I leave my house. Teach thieves not to steal. I just can't believe for how many years this talking point has been torn apart and it's still being used. By the way, everyone, Global Waffle is a myth. We had a pretty cold winter this year. Though I won't lie, the pamphlet with the squirrel mascot saying how to make someone else's death about you is absolutely hilarious. There is at least one good writer on this show. The two self-defense trainers are Daphne's moms because of course they are. The girls are all gonna face off against one another in a tournament. The winner gets a gun. Gotta be honest, this is the worst tournament arc I've ever seen in any anime ever. We cut to Fred, who's told by one of the other prisoners that a talking meatloaf is here to see him. And he immediately knows it's Velma. Not a good joke, but it's not bad either. Velma still has the hots for Fred, even though she kissed Daphne and she knows that Fred can't even cut his own meat. Velma starts hallucinating again and she kicks a guard in the face. Yeah. I'm pretty sure if you kick a prison guard in the face, you'll no longer be visiting prison, you'll just be in prison. Norvell gets Velma out of the hallucination by simping so hard that it makes her laugh. But because Velma kicked a guard in the face, she is now banned from visiting the prison, which means for as long as Fred is locked up, she cannot interview him. By the way, in this show, Fred is canonically underage, so wouldn't he have been sent to juvie and not prison? Velma goes back to the self-defense class where they give, honestly, one of the most odd self-defense tips I've ever heard in my life. If you're attacked, fall down and go limp. I gotta be honest, I've never heard any self-defense class give that tip before. Velma and Daphne are picked to fight off against one another, and this causes Daphne to run off for some reason, and Velma 
rolls after her? No, I don't get the joke either. In the bathroom, Velma and Daphne discuss their feelings, and Velma says that she's still into Fred for whatever reason. Now, I can imagine Velma being into Daphne, but why the hell is Daphne into Velma? She literally has no redeeming qualities, and she's unattractive. They both get on the fighting mat, and Daphne kicks Velma down to the ground. Awesome. And then Velma says, Daphne, what are you doing? If I was a real attacker, you could have hurt me. Wait, what? Is this show seriously trying to say that women's self-defense courses teach women not to hurt men when they attack them? When has anyone ever gotten mad at a woman for hurting a man who was attacking her? Aside from a woman using a gun, of course. We cut to Norvell, who's not banned from the prison, interviewing Fred. And Fred says, um, that he misses his mom because no one watched watches him pee like she does. Remember, Velma is Mindy Kelly's self-insert, and her self-insert is into a man who can't feed himself or use the bathroom by himself. Norvell then starts asking Fred about Velma's mom, and brings up how she went missing at his house. This makes Fred nervous, and he gets one of his lackeys to kick Norvell out. Um, how does a Nancy boy like Fred have a lackey? We cut back to our anime tournament arc, where Velma discovers... Uh, that going limp allows her to win every fight. Don't get me wrong, going limp can help you in certain fights, but she's not doing it right. She's not exactly Sea King Kaku. And yes, this is where we get that creepy image of Velma that you've seen everywhere. By the way, this is apparently a stolen joke from Mr. Bean. One, two, three, <laughs> Daphne takes out a pen and starts stabbing this big girl. Hey, um, lesbian cops, if you're looking for the killer, um, I think you found them. And it's your own kid, apparently. By the way, I think that girl that Daphne just murdered might be trans, so, um, yeah, that's, uh, probably one of the reasons why the murder rate is so high. It literally just happened right in front of two cops and they did nothing to stop it. Norvell is talking with his therapist dad and he tells him that he just doesn't think he's cut out to be a therapist. But then his dad gives him a magic card again, which will make people tell him their problems. Velma learns that Daphne does like her, but won't admit to it because she's popular. But then she comes up with a plan to steal Daphne's diary. Norvell interviews Fred again, and by using the magic card again, he gets him to open up, and it turns out Fred actually knows nothing. Well, that was pointless. We get to the final fight between Daphne and Velma, and Velma decides to read out Daphne's diary to everyone. Uh, she thinks this will destroy her popularity, but all she reads out is, yeah, sometimes she goes to therapy. This, of course, makes everyone turn on Velma. You know, I may have autism, but even I'm not autistic enough to do something like this. You see, mental health is no joke. Just ignore the fact that the writers have been making jokes about mental health throughout this entire episode. Keep in mind, Velma is supposed to be the smartest character in this show, but unfortunately, you can only write a character as smart as, well, you are, and the writers are idiots. Then we get to the absolute best part of the episode. Daphne kicks Velma into a wall. Also, apparently she kicked Velma so hard her tubes are now tied, so she can't breathe, which is good for, well, everyone in the world. Velma gets therapy from Norvell's dad, but because he doesn't have his magic cardigan anymore, he has to use something else to get her to open up, and he uses a water fountain. I'm sure someone somewhere finds this funny, but I don't. Later on, Velma is riding in a car with Norvell. Fred probably didn't do it! Yeah, but isn't it nice to see a rich white guy get falsely convicted for once? I'm too distracted to enjoy it. Like, I seriously want to know, is there a single likable character in this show? Fred and the other prisoners start rioting, and this will lead to nothing. It's only here to pat out this episode. Yes, they do escape, but whether they did or didn't, the outcome would have still been the same. Trust me, you'll understand why when we get to episode four. Velma apologizes to Daphne for reading her journal out loud, and just like in episode two, Daphne forgives her way too quickly. They reveal that they do have feelings for one another, but but for now, they'll just be friends. Wow, Velma just friend-zoned Daphne like she did to Norvell. Norvell is talking with his dad while they witness the prison riot, and Norvell's father tells his son that he's not ready for the cardigan. Norvell hands it back to his father, but then something drops out of it. It's a piece of paper that says Crystal Cove Insane Asylum. Norvell questions his father as to why he has this, and his father gets really nervous saying he has a friend who works there. Um, Norvell, why are you questioning this? And, um, Norvell's Father, why are you so nervous? Therapists work with people in insane asylums all the time. This is not out of the ordinary. Norvell's dad says his friend who works there is... Uh, 
Dr. Bad Excuse. Norvell puts the magic cardigan back on to get his father to answer his question. Norvell's father opens up and says, Son, I have to tell you something about your mother. And no, this has nothing to do with the next episode. Yep, the only reason why the cardigan was so important was so that something super convenient could happen so that the plot could move forward. The episode ends with Fred being caught by the two lesbian cops and he's tased. You know how I told you to wait until episode four to learn why the whole prison riot was pointless? Yeah, it turns out you just had to finish the credits to realize that scene was entirely pointless. I do apologize that my review of episode three was shorter than my review of episode one and two, but that's because, well, not that much happens in this episode. However, a lot of the things in this episode are important for understanding episode four. So let's move on to reviewing it. No! God! Episode 4 starts off with a flashback when Velma was in preschool. She talks about how she was never really all that popular. I mean, um, now she's popular, but, uh, for all the wrong reasons. Basically, this flashback just establishes that Velma doesn't like pretty and popular girls. Which we already knew, so this flashback is kind of pointless. Then it's revealed that another girl was murdered. So it looks like the school will have to get rid of their murder-free banner, which apparently cost... $10,000? Wow, what a relatable joke. I can't tell you how many times I tried to buy a banner, only to realize that it was the same price as a used car. Like, I really don't know who would find this joke funny. The banner also says murder-free for two weeks, so they could have only used it for a few more days before they had to get rid of it. Is the joke supposed to be about how much schools waste their budget or something? So, Fred is now exonerated. He's going to be released from prison because, um, a murder happened while he was locked up? You know there can be more than one killer, right? There could also be a copycat killer. This is one of the absolute worst reasons why anyone should be released from prison. Further proof that the writers for She-Hulk know more about the law than the writers for Velma. Velma of course makes a murder about her. How come no one ever cared this much about my missing mom? Velma, I know this might be a hot take, but someone being murdered is more serious than someone going missing. Like, I'm super autistic, and even I have the social awareness not to do something like this. The police realize a pattern in the three girls who were murdered. They're all incredibly hot. Oh my god, I know who the killer is! It's Elliot Roger! And then we get an actually funny joke. A black soldier says, Hot girls' lives are even harder now. They already spend half their days responding to compliments as is. I'm not gonna lie, that's actually a funny joke. Although, just like Norvell, this black guy is also a simp. It's confirmed every black guy in Velma is a simp. Now, because the police don't have much of a budget, they can only protect five girls. And they're, of course, gonna protect the hottest ones because they're at the highest risk. Velma, of course, has a problem with this because it's the smart thing to do. Do. Wait, so a couple of middle-aged white dudes are gonna decide which of us are hottest? Now, to be fair, middle-aged men deciding which high school girl is hottest is a bit problematic. But, um, what's the problem with them being white? Trust me, Mindy Kelly's self-insert gets a lot more racist later on. Also, every straight man throughout their entire life have ranked the hotness of every woman they've ever met. So they are the absolute best person for the job. The cop for literally no reason decides that Velma is going to be the one to make the list. You know, if you reward her bad behavior, it's just going to encourage her. Hey, Jar, are you talking about Mindy Kelly or Velma? Yes. Velma says she would rather die than make a list of which girl is hottest, even if it is to save their lives. But Velma eventually agrees to make the list, and then she says, Don't forget, ranking hot girls is exactly how the Trojan War started. One, that war was fictional, and two, Helen of Troy was kidnapped. They were trying to rescue her. They didn't go to war over her because someone rated her a two and the other person rated her an eight. Velma, of course, pushes the creation of the hot girl list onto her friend Daphne. She literally admits that most girls look like a potato in a dress to her. Then why did you agree to make the list? And also, that's what you look like. Stop projecting. The hot girls, of course, do whatever they can do to make it onto that top five list. I get that this is played for laughs, but they're literally just trying to not get murdered. <laughs> Velma says, I figured out the problem with this list. Men literally make everything about themselves. Now, personally, I think this is just Velma projecting, who, by the way, is Mindy Kelly's self-insert. Yes, I am going to keep bringing that up throughout this review. Literally, throughout this show, every single member of the Scooby-Doo gang simps after Velma. 
And she thinks men are the ones who make everything about themselves? Velma decides to get into contact with Fred so he can make the list. Who is a man, by the way, and she said men shouldn't make the list, but now she's going to a man to make the list. By the way, isn't it funny that this show keeps preaching to us why objectifying women is bad, yet it's constantly objectifying women. Now, even though Fred just got out of prison, Velma doesn't think he suffered enough. So she tricks him into reading a feminist book, which he thinks is about X-Men because it has the word mystique on it. Um, I'm gonna be honest here, Fred doesn't seem like a guy who would read an X-Men book. By the way, the feminine mystique is actually a real book. It was written by Betty Friedan. It talks about how women would rather get married and have kids over having a job or going to education. I'll link a Wikipedia article about it down below, but it is absolutely not what a modern feminist would agree with. Writers, if you're going to make up a fake title for a book, you might want to Google it first. Norville visits Daphne so he can... Uh copy her personality so Velma will like him. Yep, the writers really want you to know that he's a super mega simp. A geo rock out of nowhere gets thrown through her window and for some reason Velma thinks this is her birth parents trying to contact her? I don't know why she would jump to that conclusion. I mean, if I was in her shoes, I would assume that the killer was now after me. The mayor decides to ask Velma to make all the girls as ugly as she is. And of course, Velma brings up talking points like patriarchy and the male gay. Velma tries to uglify four of the pretty girls. Not Velma, though, because I guess she wants her to get killed. Velma says that, uh, women trying to make themselves look attractive is internalized misogyny. Norvell and Daphne start heading towards the mines, and Norvell brings up that the rock might have been from the killer, and Daphne agrees with him. Yeah, she's trying to catch the killer. I thought she was being stupid before, but it turns out I was wrong. Fred finishes the 400-page book and realizes that it's not about X-Men. Even for how dumb Fred is, I'm surprised he didn't realize that sooner. And because Fred read the feminist book, he now finds all women attractive. By the way, I'm so sick of this mentality. Read a book by Jordan Peterson and then you'll agree with him. Read the Bible and then you'll be a Christian. Like, I understand certain books do click with certain people, but just because a certain book convinced you doesn't mean it will convince everyone. Velma manages to make the pretty girls look ugly, but they're still more attractive than her. Norvell and Daphne go to a mine museum and Daphne recalls memories back to when she was a baby, which I'm pretty sure is impossible. The popular girls decide to go back to being pretty. The reasoning is that uh, no girl should change how she looks in order to not get murdered. Okay, well, enjoy getting murdered then. <laughs> they tell Velma that her definition of womanhood is even more restricted than theirs, and this causes Velma to dress up as a blue-haired elf for some reason. As they're stuck in traffic, Velma's stepmother starts to give birth. Velma tries to request a cop to escort her stepmother to the hospital, and he mistakes her for the serial killer, and, um, to be perfectly honest with how she's dressed, can you really blame him? A crowd forms around her stepmother so they can film her giving birth in public. I know this is supposed to be commentary on social media, but I've never seen a video of a woman giving birth in public. Velma gets the hot girls to distract the crowd, and she starts beating people up. You know, Velma, the cop already mistook you for the serial killer, and now he's witnessed you assaulting multiple people. Fred witnesses Velma beating up a bunch of people and... <sighs> This makes him find her attractive. And now that Fred is simping for Velma, that means everyone in the Scooby-Doo gang is simping for Velma. Daphne says that finding her parents is the only way she can find out why she's so different from everyone. Wait, what? When was that ever established? If anything, Daphne fits in way too well. We get a flashback to show how Daphne was different from everyone. So her being different wasn't established until afterwards. Wow, this is horrifically bad writing. Velma praises herself for being amazing, and her stepmom says that she hopes her baby doesn't grow up to be as ugly as Velma. Just like She-Hulk, Velma is twerking. Why is that in, like, everything? Fred tries to hit on Velma, but she's not attracted to him anymore. She says she, uh, cares about inner beauty, even though previously, 
Several times, Velma has talked about how attractive Fred is, and he's always been a terrible person. Nothing has changed. Oh no, wait, something did change. His politics. Now he sees the world how she wanted him to see it. She's just not attracted to a feminist guy. She misses it when he was really racist. Once again, Mindy Kelly's self-insert is the weirdest self-insert of all time. And after the credits, we see Gigi. In case you guys don't remember, a lot of people thought this character was actually Scooby-Doo. I'm not joking look it up. And that was episode 4. I gotta be honest, it still wasn't as bad as episode 2, but it was still pretty bad. This show is just draining out all of my motivation, I swear, and I'm not even halfway done yet. Episode 5 of Belma. <laughs> Belma. Episode 5 of Belma starts off strangely based. Her loyal simp Norville is not responding to her messages. I guess he finally had enough of her shit. She needs Norville because her hallucinations are getting out of hand, and she can't ask her neighbor Daphne because, well, Daphne makes her too hot and bothered. And, um, also Daphne is doing the whole live long and prosper thing Spock does for some reason. Her dad is also leaving her home alone because, well, he has a baby on the way. Velma is, of course, not happy about this because it's not about her. And also, there's a murderer on the loose. You're leaving me home alone with a murderer on the loose? Even though I was voted most likely to be murdered before any of this? Well, that's probably because you're absolutely insufferable. Again, Velma is the weirdest self-insert I've ever seen. Wait until you see how much pizza I eat. I can eat three slices. <laughs> Yeah, maybe three personal slices from Costco. Velma goes up to the band members with a picture of Norvell. Um, these people personally know him. You don't need a picture. Good morning, students. This is Principal Rogers. I'm here with Mayor Dave and the Sheriff. We just learned so much somewhere as Oh no, no, this show is gonna tackle cancel culture. Like, I'm fine with YouTubers tackling this topic, but whenever Hollywood does it, it's always over the top. Oh my god, that guy just jumped out of a window because he heard someone might have been intolerant. Now, throughout this show, it has done things that would piss off people who are, well, more right-leaning. And now it's gonna try to piss off people who are left-leaning as well. Who is this show for again? It turns out the police presence in the school, who are there because there's a murder on the loose, by the way, are being constantly sexually harassed by 15-year-old girls. Ah, yes, such great social commentary about how cops are constantly sexually harassed. Is that like a thing? Again, this social commentary might make sense in an alternate dimension, but not in this one. Do the girls just really want the cops to leave because they want to get murdered or something? And also, this is not intolerance, it's sexual harassment. If I called Professor Dreadlock a slur, that would be intolerance. If I grabbed him by the booty, that would be sexual harassment. And also, I do the latter. I mean, after all, he's a man. I'm far less likely to get canceled for something like that than the former. See, writers, that's a joke about cancel culture that's actually funny. So because of this, the school will have to be temporarily closed. Now, personally speaking, if I was the principal of this school, I would ask the girls to stop sexually harassing the cops, and if they didn't, I would expel them. I mean, it's more logical than making everyone else suffer. Now the kids have a 9 p.m. curfew, and the band practice sleepover is canceled. This makes Velma very happy for some reason. I mean, I guess she thinks if Norvell isn't spending spending time with her friends, he'll spend time with her, but she could have gone to the band party herself if she wanted to. In fact, thanks to the curfew, it will be harder for Norvell to visit her. We cut to Daphne, who went back to the mines without Norvell this time, even though she brought him along because she was too scared to go alone. Sorry, sign, but hot people are cut too much slack to heed warnings. <laughs> Wait, what? I mean, I know that hot people spend less jail time than ugly people for the exact same crime, and they also tend to get more raises on average, but the sign is warning her about cave-ins. Being attractive won't protect her from something like that. She then tears the planks down. Is Daphne super strong or was that just old wood? Rats and bats come out of the cave, giving her even more of a reason not to go in. And then someone grabs her. Wow, Daphne got kidnapped. This is actually starting to feel like the original Scooby-Doo. Fred is still simping for Velma. Simp! 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 
but just like most male feminists, the ugly girl turns him down. Look, I'm glad reading the feminine mystique caused a little growth. Shush, a feminist is speaking. <laughs> oh my god, that's genuinely a funny joke. A progressive is speaking over someone they claim to fight for. It's not only funny, it's relatable as well, so um, that's a point for this show. Fred tells Velma that his house used to be owned by a mad neuroscientist. Pay attention to this because it will be important later. Velma finds out that Norvell has a girlfriend, which is terrible for her because now she can't just use him as her servant anymore. I almost used a different word until I remembered he was black. I also still find it funny that to this day, so many people think this girl Gigi was actually supposed to be Scooby. For some reason, being with a hot girl makes Velma think that she can get with Don Lemon, which is something that Mendy Kelly would absolutely say. Velma at first thinks that Norville having a girlfriend now is a good thing, because he can just help Velma and not tell her about his feelings. But it turns out that Gigi doesn't want her boyfriend Norville to spend time with Velma. Sorry, Velma, but until Norval learns to stand up for himself, he's gonna do exactly as I say. Haha, <laughs> not gonna lie, that's actually a pretty good joke. So Velma, of course, replaces Norvell with Fred. She replaced a black simp with a white simp. Let's see which one is superior. Oh, Twitter is gonna be mad about that joke. Oh, and Fred guesses that Velma's race is Samoan, which is without a doubt the most insulting thing ever done to Samoan people. We cut back to Daphne's story where she finally meets her parents and what are those things? Okay, Daphne's parents are obviously wearing a disguise, which is another reference to a different Hanna-Barbera cartoon because tarnishing Scooby-Doo wasn't enough for Mindy Kelly. They explained to Daphne that her lesbian mom stole her from them and that she should go Google their criminal gang. Oh, I'm sorry, no. They tell her to look it up on Netscape Navigator, which is an old website I've never known anyone to use ever. What realm was this show made in? Navigator? Good Lord, how long have you been in here? Hello? Hello? Did you really just do an Irish exit? Huh, maybe we are related. What the hell is an Irish exit? I decided to Google it and not look it up on Netscape Navigator, whatever the hell that is. Supposedly, Irish Americans had a habit of slipping out through the side door at church to avoid chatting with people. It's a saying that I've never heard anyone use ever. I know I just said this, but what realm was this show made in? We cut to Velma and Fred who go to the Historical Society so they can look up information on Dr. Prager U. I mean Dr. Pradu. It's Historical Society. Places like this help Skip Gates learn which white actors are descended from slave owners. What? Wow, what a relatable joke. I mean, who hasn't skipped out on a date and then looked up which white actors are descended from slave owners? Many people have theorized that this show was made bad on purpose, and if it was... I gotta give props to the writers. They did an excellent job. I don't think that a modern AI that is trained to write unrelatable jokes could make a joke this unrelatable. The files on Dr. Pradu are missing and the last person to check them out was Velma's mom. Ooh, the plot thickens. Which of course means that Velma starts hallucinating again and Fred can't help her because he's, ugh. Too busy thinking about the gender pay gap. He says women make 20% less than what a man makes. I, I thought it was 23%. Why does the number keep changing? Now this whole gender pay gap thing has been torn to shreds multiple times. The statistic didn't take into account maternity leave, overtime, and multiple other things. However, even after calculating for everything, there is a gender pay gap. Women make roughly 2-4% to 4 less than men. And I do think that's an issue that we should talk about. As soon as Hollywood will stop lying about the number. Also, Asians make more than white people do on average. Though I won't lie, the male feminist not helping the woman who's suffering right in front of him is pretty funny. Velma wants to break up Norvell and Gigi because she's an absolutely terrible person who's a self-insert for Mendy Kelly. Yes, I will keep reminding you of that. She plans a band sleepover and invites Norvell and Gigi. Even though it was pretty previously established that Norvell wasn't going to go to the first one before it was cancelled, but now he will for some reason. Fred, you're not allowed in here. I know, I know, I'm not a band. Thank God. I'd rather kiss a toilet. But speaking of kissing toilets, I still want to win your heart. Okay, yes, Fred is being incredibly based, but even when he's head over heels for Velma, he's still a dick to her. Now why is Fred here? Well, it's so he can have his own subplot of getting pizza. 
I'm not joking, that's what he does. Uh, the band gets hungry, so they start eating anything they can find, and Velma still needs her parents' house to be clean, or she'll get disowned. We cut to Velma, who looks up information on the Crystal Mine Gang. Basically, they were a group of miners who lost their jobs, so they turned to crime, but kept their old costumes and created a cave civilization? This show is weird. Eventually, the gang had over 20 members, including an infant, and then Daphne's lesbian moms took them down and adopted her. Daphne's takeaway from this is that she's genetically a villain. What? Norvell's parents shove him out of the car? God, everybody's mean to this guy. Daphne tries to talk to Velma, but the party is only for band members, so Daphne kicks a random guy in the balls. Velma tries to guilt trip Norvell into helping her, but then Gigi shows up at the party. What the hell are you doing here, Gigi? Hot girls aren't in band, they're in choir. Oh my god, that is actually true. Hot girls tend to join choir over doing band practice. I'm pointing this out because the show actually made a reference to something that exists in our own reality reality for once. Gigi challenges Velma to a, I don't know, a flute off. If Gigi wins, she gets to stay. But if Velma wins, a black guy will have to work for her for free forever. Wait, what? But it turns out they both suck at playing the flute. I don't know why Gigi would challenge Velma to something she sucks at. And I don't know why Velma would accept a challenge for something she sucks at. But I guess everybody's just an idiot in this show. It's so bad this one guy unplugs his hearing aid. And this joke would have been funny if another guy didn't point it out. When you explain a joke it ruins it. We cut to Fred who's ordering the pizzas but because they're not made to his standards he throws them on the floor. Don't forget Mindy Kelly self-insert is into this dude for some reason. Daphne thinks that her parents are sus because her origin story is the same as Superman's. So my origin is the exact same as Superman? We don't know who that is. <laughs> Velma tricks Gigi into revealing that Norvell's grandmother is Dr. Padua. She tricks her very easily, by the way, because Gigi's an absolute idiot. Gigi, I swore you to secrecy. You placed your hand in your verified kit mark. Yeah, that joke was clearly written before Elon Musk bought up Twitter. This makes Norvell so upset that he runs straight into Fred for no reason, causing Fred to drop all the pizza. Because there's no food, the band members literally start chewing on the scenery. Norvell reveals that he didn't want to tell Velma about his grandmother's identity because it could ruin his mother's life. Velma guilt trips Norvell into helping her, and Norvell of course starts simping for her again. His girlfriend Gigi literally points it out. We cut to Daphne, who's also now hallucinating. I guess it's contagious or something. Because the curfew is still in effect, Velma and the others have to use Daphne's mom's cop car to get around. They steal some food out of the dumpsters, and Norvell says they should support this business because it's owned by a woman of color. It's almost as as if the writers are saying we should support this show because it's made by a woman of color. But then the cops show up and Velma actually does something selfless for once. She distracts the cops while the others get away. The cops hit Velma with their car and, oh, well, Velma's dead. Looks like the show is over. Okay, she's obviously still alive. This is episode five after all. Daphne sees a boat in the sewers and decides to go for a ride. Velma is arrested alongside Norvell's parents and they're in, um very interesting costumes. First, Daphne's parents were furries, and now Norvell's parents are furries. Velma, of course, takes a picture and uses it to blackmail Norvell's parents. Norvell's mother agrees to give Velma the information about her mother if she doesn't post the picture. So Velma, who is a detective, only found information about her mother because of dumb luck. In other words, it's a super convenient thing that happened for the plot to move forward. And that's the end of episode five. I can't believe I'm now halfway through this show and barely anything has happened. Out of every episode so far, this was by far the hardest one to get through. Hopefully episode 6 will be better than this one, but I doubt it. Episode 6 of Velma is about Mindy Kelly self-insert dancing on a stripper pole at the age of 15 for her dad. I mean, how else do you think she got to work for Hollywood? When teen dramas get right, it's that nothing is ever actually a teenager's fault. We're all really just paying for the sins of our parents. Yep, that is something that happens in a lot of teen dramas, but it's not something they get right. You're responsible for your own actions.
Wait, what? Photoshop exists? Why would they tape over a different image on top of that image? In fact, if anything, I think photoshopping would be easier than doing something like that. Fred is reading feminist literature, but then Fred's dad knocks the book out of his hand and gives him a shotgun and a glass of scotch. Oh my god, this dude is totally based. Apparently, if Velma hallucinates while learning about Norvell's grandma, she could die? Like, don't get me wrong, I feel really bad for people who suffer from hallucinations, but I don't think a hallucination can kill you, but I might be wrong on that. Velma has hallucinated multiple times and she's still alive, but if she does get a hallucination that kills her by learning about Norvell's grandmother, then I think the sooner she gets that information and dies, the better. But when it comes to truly crappy parents, no one beats my dad. You mean your dad who didn't abandon you like your mom? The guy who raised you for like 10 years all by himself? The guy who put a roof over your head? I could go on, but I think you get the idea. So what crappy thing is Velma's dad doing? He's planning a hiking trip with his girlfriend and his new kid. Wow, he actually seems like a pretty good dad. Eternity leave? When I was born, you doubled your work hours. Velma, he probably did that because he had another mouth to feed. Or because he wanted to start putting money into your college fund. I'm joking, of course, he did that because you were insufferable even as a baby. But constantly throughout this show, Velma's dad and his girlfriend constantly bring up how they don't want their baby to end up like Velma. So they're trying to do a better job at parenting. Hey Velma, wanna ride to school? Uh, sure, thanks. Absolutely not, Frederick. Unless this is your selection for our hunt? No, father, I like her now. Have you heard of inner beauty? That's a myth, you fool. <laughs> Like I said earlier, Fred's dad is completely based. They drive off and Velma says, at least my dad isn't as bad as Fred's dad. Wait a second, at the start of this episode, you said your dad was the crappiest dad in the world. I'm tired of modern writers forgetting what they just wrote. Velma's dad drives by and splashes mud all over her. Okay, now I'm starting to think that Velma's dad is pretty based. Apparently, not believing in inner beauty makes you worse than someone who dumps mud all over people. Velma learns about Norvell's grandmother, who was a neurosurgeon who figured out a way to keep the brain alive outside of the body. But despite this being the greatest discovery of all time, her work was rejected because she was a <gasps> woman scientist. Okay, I see the commentary they're trying to go for, but the thing is, something this amazing wouldn't be rejected just because a woman made it. I understand that she's Norvell's grandmother, this happened decades ago, but a black woman in the 1960s was able to help NASA do all the complicated math calculations to make the moon landing possible. Possible. Her name is Katherine Johnson, by the way, you should look her up. The point I'm trying to make is that this commentary the show is trying to make is just super overblown. Hang on a second, I think I might have said porn instead of point by mistake there. America was at war with communist Russia during this time. They wouldn't reject being able to keep brains alive outside of the body just because a woman did it. But I guess this scene isn't that bad because a general is into her idea. Apparently military generals are more progressive aggressive than scientist who felt he could use it to spy on what he believed to be the biggest threat to the American way of life. Oh, let me guess. Communists? Meat made from plants? Women's sports? How could women's sports be a threat? No one watches it. Well, except for tennis, because we like to hear them grunt. Although, with the inclusion of trans athletes, women's sports has gotten a lot more complicated. No. Meddling kids. Ah, yes, the government does believe that peaceful protests are the greatest threat to America. That's why they made it legal to peacefully protest. Yeah, this commentary does not work because America has, like, the most freedom of speech out of any country in the world. Shut up, UK. No one in our country got arrested because they made their girlfriend's pug do a Roman salute. The general has tried before to infiltrate the hippie protesters, but he was always caught because he couldn't replicate their incredibly complicated hand signs like the peace hand sign. Wait, what? Where's the joke? I don't even think a five-year-old would find this funny. Also, the hippies would pull off the general's mask, get it? They're trying to tie this show into Scooby-Doo. The general would also hypnotize people into working for him, but the hypnosis is broken if someone snaps their fingers. Wow, that sounds like a pretty terrible design flaw. And yes, the reason why Velma experiences her hallucinations is because she's under mind control. Now, there's no way that nearly for a decade, no one has snapped their fingers around her. In fact, we've seen people snap their fingers around her before. Hey, girlies. <laughs> 
This might be the single worst piece of writing I've ever seen in my entire life. I could see a little kid not taking into account how much people snap their fingers, but not an entire team of adult writers. So the only solution left for the general was to put a soldier's brain into a teenager's body. Seems like it would be easier just to make protesting illegal. He called this plan the, uh, Special Covert Operations Brain Initiative. Or Scooby for short, the writers weren't clever enough to have a word for the first O, so they just took the C and O together from the word covert. Also, Scooby's name ends with a Y, not an I. If you have to force your acronym to make sense, it's probably not a good acronym. Scooby? And wait, what did Scooby do? Uh... Now, despite Norvell's grandmother figuring out a way to keep the brain alive outside the body, she was unable to figure out how to transfer the brain into a new body. Eventually, she gives up. She has her lab walled off, she gives her journals away so no one can find them, and she puts herself into an insane asylum. But wait, my mom disappeared after finding Dr. Purdue's journals, and the dead girls all had their brains removed. Could they be connected? Wow, for all your personality flaws, you're actually a pretty good detective. What? No, she isn't. This is the most logical conclusion that anyone would come to. I've said it before and I'll say it again. Writers can only make characters as smart as they are. We get a random jump scare hallucination because of course we do. We cut to Daphne meeting up with her parents who are, um, mining so they can sell crystals. Yeah, that's basically it for now. Let's cut back to Velma. She wakes up in a hospital bed, then hallucinates again and passes out again. So Velma finally decides that it's time to cure her hallucinations. And she thinks that her hallucinations might be caused by her dad not believing her that her mother was kidnapped, even though in episode one it was established that Velma knows that her mother left them because she was a terrible person. Daphne's dad tricks her into bashing a crystal against her head. Okay, even he's based. Daphne's parents' plan is to sell a bunch of crystals, because modern day millennials believe that crystals have magic magic powers. And we learn the reason as to why Daphne has orange hair. It's because her biological mother smoked a lot during pregnancy. To anyone watching this video right now, can you spot the joke? Because I can't. Velma and her dad go to a strip club. Somehow, despite her being 15, they let her in. Oh yeah, and by the way, to whatever editor I send this to, uh, please do a good job censoring. Alrighty then. <laughs> I need you to believe me that mom was kidnapped. Dad, in order for me to stop hallucinating, I need you to join in on my delusions. If any girl or person for that matter tells you to do something for them in order to stop their hallucinations, run. Velma's dad gets a work phone call, so because he's trying to provide for the family, she decides to get on a pole and start dancing. But Fred is also there because his dad took him to a strip club. Once again, Fred's dad is super based. Velma finally gets her dad's attention and everybody leaves the strip club and um, can you really blame them? Norvell decides not to be a simp anymore because he doesn't want to end up like his dad. The only dad in this episode who isn't based. Velma and her dad go fishing. He pulls up the very famous Scooby-Doo ghost. Man, Velma's dad is strong. And that's a strong fishing pole. And yes, this is one of those jokes that goes, hey, look, reference. Hey, look. Fred reveals to Velma that the entire time he was spending time with her, he was actually working. For some reason, this makes Velma upset, but the thing is, Velma, he was spending time with you, and you'd even know he was working, so he was providing for the family while spending time with you. What do you want? It's not that simple. What do you want? Velma decides that her hallucinations are caused by trying to get her dad to love her, and this allows her to open the box. By the way, that's not what's causing her hallucinations, but we'll get to that later. What the fuck? It turns out there's nothing inside the box, and Norvell's mom just exposition dumps a bunch of stuff onto Velma. Also, Velma doesn't believe in ghosts, even though her and her dad literally just pulled one up while fishing. But I guess the writers just forgot what they written again. See, I, I saw from short-term memory loss. Short-term memory loss. We cut back to Daphne, whose biological parents don't actually love her. They were just using her as a hostage. But then her stepmoms come in and save her. But Daphne's biological parents manage to get away by using a camera flash to make a bunch of bats fly around all over the place. 
Huh, well I hope this side plot wasn't entirely pointless and actually leads to something. We get to the scene from the trailer where a bunch of bricks fall on Velma and Fred. It's a good scene because Velma is in pain. Velma's dad shows up and explains why he had to work so much. Velma, I'm sorry for how much I worked when you were little, but I figured you were fine because you had your mother. But then she walked out on us and I wanted to be there for you, but it's too hard because I feel so guilty. So I hide at work. Yeah, it's almost like he had to provide for the family or something. Velma experiences another hallucination, and the only way for her dad to get her out of it is to believe her truth. Which, by the way, I've always hated the term my truth because there's only one truth. The truth. You know, objective reality. But her dad does end up believing Velma that her mother was kidnapped because there's a piece of paper with the word Jinkies on it in his wife's handwriting. Yeah, um, that doesn't prove she was kidnapped, that only proves that she was here. And that was episode 6. I gotta be honest, it wasn't as hard to get through as episode 5, so I'm going to hold out hope that episode 7 is even better. Abandon all hope, ye who enter here. Episode 7 of Velma is one of the more infamous episodes, and considering the episodes I've reviewed already, that's saying a lot. It's the one where Velma dresses up like a man and experiences male privilege. I would highly recommend checking out the book Self-Made Man to see how privileged a woman would really be if she disguised herself as a man. The episode starts off with Velma following the one clue she has about her missing mother, the word Jinkies. She goes to see Jinkies the Clown, but he already hung himself in Minecraft because he realized he was in the Velma show. Oh God, Sophie, no! There's a message written on the wall in her blood. Oh God, if she's dead, who's gonna clean that up? Uh, Jesus, Velma. I know you only think about yourself, but your stepmother just died. Now, at first, I was very surprised that this show actually had the balls to kill off Sophie. But she actually isn't dead. She was just inviting her husband to Fogfest. Kind of seems like a fucked up thing to do, considering there's a killer on the loose, but whatever. Demon! Velma, stop! This was a fog puzzle. A fog puzzle? Yeah, you know, like a fog puzzle, but for Fogfest. Fogfest? You know, the one night a year all of Crystal Cove comes out to celebrate its world famous spooky fog and pick the fog king and queen. Get it, fog king? If you say it really fast, it sounds like you're saying, um, a word that YouTube does not like me saying. And yes, the writers will hammer in this joke they're so proud of throughout this entire episode. No, I know what fog puzzles and fog fest are. What I don't understand is how it can still be happening with the serial killer on the loose. What happened to curfew? It was working. Oh my God. Velma actually said something smart. Curfew is over. Because it's not a serial killer, it's the ghost of Dr. Edna Purdue. Even if people do believe it's a ghost and not a serial killer, that's more reason to stay inside. You can shoot a serial killer, but you can't shoot a ghost. But it turns out you can only go to the Fog Festival if you have a date. Which was a rule that was probably only made to keep Velma out. Look, you're not the only one worried about curfew ending, Velma. Which is why no girl will be admitted to Fogfest without a date to protect them. Smart, right? Wait, girls have to have a date? Great, so Fogfest is not only dangerous, it's sexist too. Men on average have 26 to 40% more upper body strength than women. If there's a killer on the loose whose main target is women, a man should be with you to protect you. You can call it sexist all you want, but it's still a smart safety precaution. We cut to Fred, who's still simping for Velma, and his parents tell him that he needs to stop being such a loser. Norville gives Gigi a request to come to Fogfest with him. And she's like, I mean, in the last episode, you were ignoring me when I was dying from a bee sting. And I also 100% believe that a ghost of your grandmother is killing those girls and scooping out their brains. So I'll think about it. I'm joking, of course. She doesn't just think about it. She immediately says yes. Norville, oh you're going to Fogfest? You can't actually believe this ghost bee as much your grandma too. You're a man of reason. You talked to me on my flat earth thing. I don't care if this is the 18th time I've said this, but Velma is Mindy Kelly's self-insert. So was Mindy Kelly a flat earther at one point? Also, don't forget, Velma's supposed to be the smart one. So the Fog Festival has a bunch of magic fog that teleports people around to different locations. I'm not making this up. 
There has been absolutely nothing mystical in this show, aside from one throwaway joke about a ghost, but all of a sudden, seven episodes in, there's mystical fog that can teleport people. Like, what the fog is going on? This fog can even switch the clothing of people. Also, considering it switched the clothes of two prepubescent girls, I certainly hope that fog is on a watch list. That fog has fogged around for too long. You've been working on that jinkies clue for days. The best thing you can do is let off some steam. And what is steam if not hot fog? I don't know, maybe you're right. But girls have to have a date to go. And my bottom of the barrel kill myself desperation date is taken. Wait, is she talking about herself? I think she was talking about Shaggy. <laughs> Fred throws money at Daphne so she will go to Fogfest with him. God, Fred is still being incredibly based. Once again, another joke that genuinely made me laugh. No, Daphne, Fred's really asking me, and I'm supposed to be scared. He's back into basic hot girls who work out and wear non-candy jewelry. Oh, if only that were true, my buttery little beach ball, but I am asking Daphne. Huh? I have to be Fog King. <gasps> Excuse me? <laughs> oh. Wait, you said Fog King, not Fog... Haha, <laughs> get it guys? It sounds like he said another word that you can say in PG-13 movies, but not on YouTube, even though you have to be 13 to have a YouTube account. It turns out that throwing money at women actually worked, so Daphne will be going to Fogfest with Fred. Daphne gets all dolled up for the festival, and um, yeah, uh, she looks really good. Then again, the main thing we've been seeing throughout this show is Velma, who is absolutely repulsive. So maybe she just looks good by comparison. Yeah, what's that like? Wait, and now you're drinking? That's uncharacteristic! Wait, what? How is that uncharacteristic of her? She sells drugs! Velma learns through reading her mother's manuscript that if she takes a Jinkies note and holds it up to the light, it will reveal a hidden phone number. Once again, Velma didn't do any detective work. She was just told the answer. She calls the phone number, and it belongs to the serial killer. They just do some creepy breathing and hang up. Well, Velma, now that you know this phone number belongs to the serial killer, maybe look up who that number belongs to. It's easy. All you gotta do is use the white pages. Velma learns that the serial killer is at Fogfest, and she disguises herself as a man to get in. You know, this episode hasn't been that bad so far, but I think this is the part where it really goes downhill. There's something funny about you. Not LOL funny, but more thoughtful and well-observed, like a female-driven comedy. Wow, that one line kind of just sums up this entire show now, doesn't it? Velma, while she's disguised as a man, punches the cop straight in the nuts, and she's, of course, not immediately arrested. They just let her on through. Okay, I know Mindy Kelly's a woman that thinks males are more privileged than her, but just because a woman can assault a man and get away with it, doesn't mean a guy can, especially to a cop, when they're a POC. Once again, this show's commentary just doesn't make any sense at all. Every single man throughout all of fucking history who did anything like this got arrested. Velma is on one of those drop rides and she decides to get off of it and climb down a ladder, and then she falls to her death. <laughs> Oh, thank god the show is over. No, she of course survives by falling somewhere this show belongs, in a pile of trash. Fred is bribing people to vote for him, but then Daphne notices Velma disguised as a man, and for some reason she's attracted to a guy she just saw rolling in trash. Velma disguised as a man is being stared at by a bunch of women who come on to her. Yeah, because women are so well known for staring at men in public, and women are also known for approaching men. Again, what alternate universe was this show made in? Because I want to go to it. But this commentary also falls flat because, well, Velma being disguised as a man is being treated better than any other male in this series. In fact, we cut to Fred and Norvell fighting each other. Oh my god, that was amazing! Guys put zero pressure on you to wash your hands. Okay, that's actually a joke that exists in our reality. Too bad it isn't funny. Daphne, who is absolutely hammered, asks Velma disguised as a man if she would like to dance. Velma, of course, takes over the entire dance floor because she's a man and completely fails at doing the worm, which makes everybody cheer for her. Now, in reality, if a guy did something like this, he would be laughed at. Wait, wait a second. As a guy, 
why everyone thinks my worst qualities as a girl are awesome. Uh, I guess the commentary was just too subtle. The writers literally had to spell it out for us. Remember all those conspiracies from leftists that Mindy Kelly was secretly right-wing and she just made this show as a parody of what wokeness is? I see where those people are coming from now. Velma warns everybody about the serial killer and they listen to her because they think she's a man. Yep, men are always believed, especially in court. I would like to deconstruct why this commentary doesn't work, but it's so on the nose that I don't even have to. Like even far left-leaning people cringed at this, just like how far right-leaning people cringed at Kange West. Anyways, let's get back to the show. Velma becomes Fog King, wait what? Of course she does, because she's a man, she got male privilege, let's just ignore all the other men who are here. This is just like that one time when Professor Dreadlock made himself white, and then he became president. Sure, there were literally hundreds of millions of white people living in America during that time, but he got to be president because, well, he's white. Holy crap, no wonder men are so desperate to hold onto their power. This is the easiest shit ever. As a guy, I can do anything. And it's easier for you than any other male in this series because, well, the writers suck at doing commentary. Literally, after she's elected to be Fog King, we cut to Gigi shitting on Norvell. Men have so much privilege, as long as they're Velma, apparently. We cut to a montage of Velma fantasizing what she can do with her male privilege, like showing up to a job interview with a note that just says, I'm awesome, and is also given a gift basket of wine and soap? Yeah, you know, those things that men like so much. She also uses her butt to make some art and immediately becomes a success. She even gets a ribbon that says best artist ever. Yep, it's just that easy for men. I mean, I've been doing YouTube for nearly a decade and I still can barely pay the bills. I bet you'd be great at farting. Just playing that clip to show you that the writers are still trying to hammer this joke into the ground. Much like how Daphne is going to hammer Velma into the ground. Oh! Daphne rants to Velma about how terrible of a person Velma is. This would be a great moment for character development, but knowing the writers, I doubt that will happen. Velma and Daphne are about to kiss and, oh my god, I just now realized this, Velma is also a short man. Short men have it way harder than tall men, so this commentary even works less than I once thought it did. But then Fred shows up and cock blocks them, and despite being an idiot who can't even feed himself, he figures out that Velma disguised as a man is actually Velma. 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 Ow, that's my actual mustache, Fred. I just didn't shave it. Gross. Fred tells everyone that Velma can't become the Fog King because she's actually a woman in disguise. So Norville actually wins the crown because he saved a little girl off screen? Wow, he's such a good guy and oh wait, he pushed that girl off the pier. Velma actually apologizes to Daphne. Wow, there actually was some character development. And then the serial killer finally shows up. I mean, we're only 70% done with this show and just now it showed up. The serial killer is about to kill Velma and then the fog switches his weapon out for a chiro. Wow, this is like something a toddler would come up with. And the bad guy came at the unarmed prince with a sword, and then the sword turned into a pool noodle. I think my search is over, everyone. I found the worst written scene in anything ever. I don't think there's anything that could possibly top this, but if you can think of anything, um, let me know in the comments. We get a classic Scooby-Doo chase scene. <laughs> Yeah, they take a few moments to insult the original Scooby-Doo show. Oh, look! An old tiny photo booth! We can disguise ourselves! Damn it, it's stupid! It will take at least five minutes to change! Who would ever stop to put on a costume in the middle of the chase? Still not as bad writing as the villain's weapon suddenly transformed into a churro. Oh my god, remember how in my Rise of Skywalker review, I brought up how so many super convenient things kept on happening for the plot to move forward, that I had to use quantum mechanics to explain how convenient it all was? If this was all replaced with Rey suddenly flipping a coin and it landing in her hand as a chocolate, I would say that this movie was actually more logical. Yeah, I didn't think the Velma show would actually do something like this, and I know the knife didn't actually quantumly change into 
into a churro. It was the magic fog, but it's still pretty stupid. And something super convenient that happened so the plot could move forward. Anyways, they lose a serial killer, Norvell and Gigi make up. Velma has the serial killer cell phone, so now she can find them. And we get an after credit scene of Fred getting taken out by the serial killer. Okay, uh, this episode didn't start off that bad, but uh, it definitely became the worst episode of any show I've ever seen ever. It tops episode four of Kenobi and the Ahsoka finale. Just three more episodes to go, folks, and if any of them are worse than this one, I will definitely be impressed. Velma, episode eight. The episode starts off with a flashback of Velma and Daphne in kindergarten. Velma immediately decides that she's going to exploit Daphne for the rest of her life, and then she calls her mom an old bag. Just like in episode one, we're reminded that Velma always was a terrible person. Velma drags Daphne away from her own birthday party and then steals the cake. And after Daphne finally realizes just how terrible of a person Velma is and gets new friends, Velma starts dragging Norville around with her. Keep in mind, this is told from her perspective. It's kind of like Elliot Rogers' manifesto. Even from his own perspective, he's a terrible person. I have absolutely no idea why Mindy Kelly would write her own self-insert like this, but she did. Thelma, can you help me find Fred? He's missing and I know your people are great at tracking. Well, at least we now see where Fred got his racism from. And this is also a joke that can actually work in our reality. Indian people get mistaken for like every other race in America. Because Daphne and Velma are friends again, Velma immediately starts dragging Daphne around with her. Gee, I wonder how being friends with Velma will end for Daphne. We cut to two days later and they're trapped under a rock. Yeah, it's one of those jokes that goes, Wow, I can't wait to do this. And then it cuts to, I hate that I actually did this. Now don't get me wrong, this joke was pretty funny the first three or four times I heard it, but now it's really overplayed its welcome. Now I should warn you that there's going to be a lot of time skipping in this episode, and we'll also be getting these very bland graphic cards of white text on a black background. Now I hire a lot of editors to edit my videos for me, so I'm really out of practice when it comes to editing. But even I can make a graphics card that looks better than this. If we die, it's your fault! My fault? Nothing is ever my fault! Wow, Velma is almost as narcissistic as the average writer in Hollywood. Daphne has a flashback and we cut back to two days earlier. Velma is trying to hack into the serial killer's phone. I've tried mustache fan, I took the red pill, and van owner. Ha ha, I get it. That's things that people who politically disagree with Mindy Kelly say. Now, personally speaking, if I was trying to guess the password for a serial killer's phone, I would put in the word Velma. Velma acts extremely possessive over Daphne just because they're friends, and she even insults her moms right in front of her. Remember that kind of friend you had in middle school that your parents didn't want you hanging out with? Well, Velma's the type of person who that kid's parents wouldn't want them hanging out with. We learned that Daphne used to hack other people's phones. But of course, we get some more self-referential humor. Yay! Rick and Morty and the Deadpool movie were funny when they came out, but I'm so sick of this type of humor. I like it when they use a title card with the character's name when they cut to a different flashback. Now that feels lazy. It's stylized. It's Tarantino. What is the incident? My god, the self-referential jokes are still going. Hey, isn't it lazy when writers do this? Yes. Yes, it is. Stop pointing it out. They thanked the North Koreans when they kidnapped my brother. Okay, I'm not gonna lie, that joke was pretty funny. Fred finds the talking brains of all the girls who were murdered, and then he faints, but at least at long last we finally get some plot. We cut back to Velma's house, and Velma's moms are, uh, still making meta jokes about the title cards. We learn how Velma hacks into phones, and okay. I've complained a lot about how writers don't know the most basic things about hacking. Most recently in my review of Ahsoka episode 2, when Savine was trying to hack that HK droid by getting all the lights to turn a certain color. By the way, in the video where I reviewed that episode, I still haven't broken even, so please go check it out. Ed is brought to Savine, and she tries to hack into its memory banks to find the location of the Sith. But somehow the writers of Velma know even less about how hacking works. Daphne, uh, shines a black light on the phone to see what numbers were mostly pushed. But we can use. 
use the light to tell which numbers the serial killer presses most often by the smudges. Aha! So you did hack into someone's phone. Okay, I know they got the idea for this from National Treasure. But the thing is, that was a keypad that was rarely used. But this is a touchscreen phone. You know, a phone that people touch all over. And Velma was also pressing a whole bunch of keys herself earlier. This would never work in real life. All the writers have phones, they could have tested this themselves. This has to be the worst writing about hacking in anything ever. The password is 1234. Okay, first of all, it could be a different combination of those four numbers. Second, this wasn't Velma's first guess. Third, the serial killer is an absolute idiot for making their password so obvious. And fourth, Velma was guessing words like mustache and red pill. This is a number combination, it has no letters. So the writers literally forgot what they just wrote. So after Daphne was able to, uh, hack the phone, even though Velma's the smart one and still hasn't solved any mysteries yet, literally everybody around her has been solving the mystery for her, they open the phone and they see that, uh, the serial killer accidentally took a photo of their base. Yep, another clue that super conveniently fell into Velma's lap. We cut back to Fred and the brains explain to him that the serial killer is planning to put their brains into someone else. Now a lot of people thought that Gigi's brain was going to be taken out and put into Scooby's body, and that's the origin to how Scooby can talk, but they don't do that. You going from Daphne to Velma is worse than going from a beloved cartoon to a playful reimagining. Whoa! I would never call this show a playful reimagining. It's more like, um, the worst show ever made. Because Fred is now a feminist, he wants to bang the brains. Ew. Daphne, come on, it's time to go look for the serial killer in the woods. And yes, saying that out loud for the first time, it sounds like a terrible idea, but... Hey, Velma, look, I'm sorry it's so last minute, but... I can't go. What? Why not? I brought your favorite snacks. Water and pictures of Tom Holland. Okay, um, I have something embarrassing to admit. When everybody was obsessing over Tom Holland, I actually thought they were talking about the guy who directed the Langoliers movie. I now know it's the modern Spider-Man, but for the longest time, I thought people were talking about the director Tom Holland and not the actor Tom Holland. But Daphne wants to spend time with Olive instead so they can fight against discrimination against hot girls? I literally can't tell if the writers think that hot girls are discriminated against, or they're making a joke at the expense of hot girls. I think I understand Poe's law more now than ever. Velma throws a potted plant, then tries to gaslight Daphne by pretending that she's having another hallucination. Daphne's flashback finally ends, and we cut back to the present. And apparently Gigi is also trapped under the rock with them. Oh, and Norvell as well. Gigi claims that it's Norvell's fault that they're trapped down here, and we cut to her flashback. My parents are actually out of town, so could you be a gentleman and unzip me? Oh, say no more. I do this for my mom all the time now that she's perimenopausal and constantly bloats. Goodbye to her reproductive years, but hello to womanhood's beautiful final chapter. You're good? Hmm. <laughs> okay, uh, that was a pretty good joke. I know this show at least has one good writer. Norvell receives a message from Velma and asks Gigi if they can use her parents' cabin in the woods. Gigi thinks this is Norvell trying to put the moves on her, so she gladly agrees to go with him. We cut to Fred trying to cook a rat, and then it explodes. One of the brains in the jar thinks that Fred's incompetence is hot, so she starts hitting on him. But because Fred said it seems real, the brain no longer finds him attractive. Even when a woman loses her her body, her standards are still impossible to reach. I can't believe I let you drink from my jar. <laughs> Gross. Velma, Daphne, Norvell, and Gigi all finally meet up. Gigi is naked and disappointed. We're looking for the serial killer. The serial killer is near my cabin and you didn't tell me? The hottest remaining girl at the school? I wasn't expecting you to be here. Also, for what it's worth, Daphne is technically hotter. You just have a mildly better personality. Ha! Now Norvell's based. We cut back to the present where Norvell tries to signal for help. A helicopter comes to rescue them, but then they leave without saving them because a rich white kid is missing. 
I mean, that's the excuse they give, but I think they just didn't want to save Velma. For some reason, Velma tells the helicopter team that they don't know where Fred is, even though she does because he was taken by the serial killer. But I guess Velma just wants to watch all her friends die, even if she has to sacrifice herself in order to do it. We cut to another flashback where Norvell says his mom is hot. Daphne finally blows up at Velma for being such a terrible person. Gigi also leaves with Daphne. Oh, and apparently she had edible underwear on. Norvell reveals to Velma that Daphne tried to hack Gigi's phone. It looks like Daphne and Gigi got together, but they're actually on top of a crumbling rock face. Norvell and Velma approach them, and then they all fall to her death. Daphne admits that it's all her fault that they're in this situation, even though it's clearly Velma's fault. They learn that they can move the rock and get out of here, but only if one of them gets crushed to death. Well, the choice is obvious! Pick Velma! The rock gets dislodged, they fall down the ravine, and they of course survive. Did I die and go to hell? No. I've been asking myself the same question ever since I started reviewing this show. Velma yells out for her mom, which nearly causes the cave to collapse. For some reason, her shouting can make the cave do that, but not the rock. Loudly crashing down! A stalactite falls down and Norvell tries to save Velma over his girlfriend Gigi. We cut to Fred, who I think just got done sleeping with one of the brains. And apparently he's been dating all three of them. It's a love square. I mean, I've heard of mindfuck, but this is on a whole nother level. Velma finally apologizes to Daphne for being an absolutely horrible person. Well, then maybe we're both too messed up to be friends. So maybe it's time we try being girlfriends. Girlfriends? That's just dumb. If you can't stand each other as friends, you shouldn't be in a relationship. Fred sees Velma come through the door and he throws a brain at her, but unfortunately he misses and hits Daphne. The cave starts collapsing. They all grab the brains and start running out. Velma has to jump over an incredibly small gap. Like, look at this. It's not even a foot long. But the crack opens up wider and Velma finally falls to her death. But then her mom shows up and saves her. Yep, her mom showed up at the perfect time. One could say it's a super convenient thing that happened for the plot to move forward. Now get in this mystery, jalopy! Ah. Uh... Ugh, let's just wrap up this episode review. Velma asks her mom what happened to her all those years she's been gone, and Velma's mother, of course, doesn't remember. Yep, I thought the writing couldn't get worse, but now we're getting an amnesia side story. So that was episode 8. I gotta be honest, it wasn't as bad as episode 7, but it was still pretty bad. Episode 9 of Velma starts off with a 15-year-old girl getting her butt implants knocked out. Well, we're off to a great start. Velma's mom, who claims she has amnesia and was found at the crime scene, is not arrested. Now, personally speaking, I think she's being absolutely sus. But everybody is an idiot in this show, so her excuse of, um, I have amnesia is completely bought by the cops. What? 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 Now, according to your mother's chart, she's constructed a sort of mental wall to block out the past two years. If Dia's memories do return, it will be within 72 hours. After that, they're gone forever. Gone forever? Gone forever? I'm not a doctor, but does amnesia work like that? I never heard anything like this brought up in any series that deals with amnesia. Also, Velma literally just said they shouldn't listen to this guy because he's a white guy with a clipboard, but for some reason, they're gonna listen to him. Velma is gonna try to keep her mom happy for 72 hours because that's how memory works. They try to hide the fact that Velma's dad remarried even though she left the family voluntarily and she's been gone for years. It's not cheating if the other person thinks you're dead. So Velma starts treating Sophie like shit. She rushes her out the door, throws a bunch of her stuff into the fire, and trashes the house despite all the time Sophie was nice to her. Like I get that they're trashing the house because that's how her mother remembers it. Her mother Mother clearly wasn't the best housekeeper, but I thought they were trying to make her happy, not have things look like how they used to. If I came home and the whole place was cleaner than it's ever been, I would be extremely happy. You have to put your back into it if we're gonna make this place smell like my mom. Help. Help. 
Why are you like this? I take back what I said about Velma's mom not being the best housekeeper. She was just a horrible mother. I completely understand why her dad remarried after she left. I'm starting to understand how Velma ended up the way she did. Now the girls' brains in jars are having a welcome back party, and Velma and Daphne think they're going to upstage them by going as a couple. Um, a lesbian couple isn't more unique than a living brain in a jar, let alone three of them. Then again, Velma being in a relationship with anyone is pretty extraordinary. It's fine. I'm popular enough for both of us. You just relax and heavily medicated trophy wife it. Trophy wife is the last thing I would call Velma. Velma's mom holds her old glasses and it triggers a memory. She went to Fred's family manor, which we already knew about. Velma finally opens up the present that has been built up since episode one, and it's a pair of shoes. Yep, it's an anti Chekhov's gun. I don't know I, what happened, but I'm really sorry. About I have it. blue balls. That's Velma's mom gets upset because she missed so many years of her daughter's life, which, personally speaking, if I miss so many years of my daughter's life in my daughter was Velma, that would make me happy. It's not sad. She's getting upset and losing her memories. Quick, make her feel good by telling her she's more attractive than her sister. Mom, it's okay. I may be older, but I'm still the same old Velma. Velma, your dad told you to make her happy, not give her a panic attack. We get a montage of Velma ruining her own life, having all of her sashes ripped off one after another, one of which was future TV writer, which 100% confirms that she is a self-insert for Mindy Kelly. Ladies and gentlemen, we got him. Yeah. Bring me your report cards. I'm sure the happiness I feel will help me remember everything and we'll finally catch the serial killer. Okay, I've seen this entire show, so I know her mother really does have amnesia. But when I first saw this, I thought Velma's mom was just fucking with her. The brains in jars decide to revoke Velma's popularity because she left them for dead in the mines. But wasn't Velma the one who saved them, so shouldn't her popularity skyrocket? Also, we see the two gay guys from before making out in the background. I don't know, maybe this same-sex couple is trying to upstage the brains or something. I'm out for two-timing the brains in the caves. Even the girl who pretends to be a cat won't talk to me anymore. Whoa, Fred, be careful. That person could go by Neo pronouns. And that's my one joke for this video that will piss off the art CC. Velma decides to interrupt Norvell while he's in the middle of a state champion fencing competition and he loses out on a million dollars. This couldn't wait until later. She wants him to hack into his mom's computer so he can change her report card. And he goes along with this despite her making him lose a million dollars. No one wants Daphne, an extremely attractive girl, to sit at their table. So she has to sit with Fred who's covered in garbage bees. Not the bees! Not the bees! Do you see where being friends with Velma gets you in life? Then one of the popular girls throws a chicken leg at Fred. You know, he may no longer be popular, but he's still rich. He can still mess you up. You know that, right? Norvell gives Velma the fake report card. He gave her an A plus in everything, except for Jim. I guess he wanted to make it as realistic as possible. Norvell, thank you. Sincerely, you're an incredible friend. God, Mindy Kelly, I mean Velma, is such a horrible person. Why does anyone spend time with her again? It turns out it's not the serial killer. It's just a poor mother looking after her baby. She was literally kicked out of the house into the cold. She just needed a blanket for her baby. Wait, you lived here? Amon, did you have an affair and a baby while I was... While I was... Wait, what happened to me again? Mom, it's okay. Dad, uh, didn't have an affair and a baby. Where's the lie? He didn't have an affair. She left. He thought she was dead. She's been gone for years, and he moved on with his life. Velma claims that the baby is hers, which is a lie I don't think anyone would fall for because they couldn't picture anyone impregnating Velma. I mean, the amount of alcohol it would take any man to do that would be lethal. Velma claims that the father is Norvell, and this causes her mother to faint because because her daughter got with a black guy. Why would you tell your mom the baby is yours? She's already had an unwanted baby in her life. Once again, Velma's dad is being based. Because we have to protect her memory, and anything's better than learning your husband cheated on you the instant you were kidnapped. 
He didn't cheat for the last time he thought she left and possibly was dead. Although I will say him getting with the waitress just six weeks later is not a good look on him. Okay, Velma's mom didn't faint because her daughter got with a black guy. She actually fainted because some of her memories returned. She found the lab entrance, but it was bricked up. So she went down a secret entrance through a well. She got attacked by a bat and then bit its wings off. I'm not joking, that's how she described it. I don't like that you had a baby, but even though Amon and I had our problems, it's better than him having cheated on me. Oh my god, shut up. Sophie finally can't take any more of this insanity and snaps. And honestly, I can't blame her. She gets Velma's dad to give her a ton of money before she leaves. Thank you, but now that the truth is out, Velma and Norval can look after their daughter themselves. Like hell we can. I mean, of course. How hard can watching it be? Right, Norval? Norval? <laughs> Who was this show made for? They constantly make so many leftist talking points, but then they make a joke about a black guy leaving after the baby is born. Also, Velma would not make a great mother because she literally just dropped the baby after it was finally given to her. It's just, there's nothing better than having a daughter. Everything is better than having Velma as a daughter. The baby tries to take a shit on Velma because it's incredibly based, but then Norvell comes in and he has to save the day. You know I legally can't be alone with a child after I eat my health class egg baby. I just want you guys to know that Mindy Kelly made a self-insert of herself that eats babies. Sorry, had to go tell my parents what we're doing. My dad is very excited. My mom, however, wants me to transfer schools and find better friends. Norvell's mom is also incredibly based. Velma, she's hungry. She's not hungry. When I showed her my boobs, she fainted. Okay, first of all, gross. And second of all, did Velma not take sex ed or something? Women don't start lactating until after they become pregnant. Daphne comes over and Velma actually says some sweet things to her. Huh. That's kind of out of character for her. Daphne learns that Velma is pretending to be in a relationship, so she decides to fake her own relationship with Fred to be popular again. Wait, what? Velma's the one who saved the brain, so if you were in a relationship with Velma, you would get your popularity back. But instead, she's going to pretend to be in a relationship with Fred, who's also unpopular because the brain said so. Oh no! Fred! What happened? I've said it a few times and I'm still gonna say it. Fred's dad is incredibly based. It turns out that Fred was practicing being swirlied and he passed out. Daphne tells him that they should rekindle their relationship so they can become popular again. And Fred's mom tells her that she wishes her son was more like her. Pay attention to this because it will become important later. Surprisingly, them being in a relationship again works somehow. Also, I have no idea how Fred became the unpopular kid when he goes to school in a limo. Rich kids always become popular at school because they can get you stuff. Velma passes off the baby onto Norvell's dad because she's such a horrible mother. Fred and Daphne stage a fake fight so everybody can catch it on camera. Oh my god, it's just like Prince Harry's relationship. Norvell is fencing at the Virgin Convention. Wait a second, isn't he pretending to be Velma's baby daddy? So wouldn't people assume he's not a virgin? Also, I don't know that much about fencing. I literally only took one class in it, but um... Are fencers stereotyped as virgins? Like, where does leftist media get their stereotypes from? This is like when BuzzFeed said that eating fried chicken was a non-white stereotype, when it's obviously a black stereotype. Daphne and Fred's plan to take away the popularity from the brains works, somehow. And Velma continues being a terrible mother by letting her fake baby put fencing swords in its mouth. Do you know how many germs are on those things? And pulling its tiny blanket off while she sleeps. Even when she's unconscious, she's a terrible person. Velma's mom witnessing her daughter being such a terrible mother, just like her, gets another flashback and it's revealed she's not actually the serial killer. Velma, I changed your grades. I agreed to be the fake father of your fake baby, but I will not compromise my journalistic integrity for you. I refuse to print this headline. Okay, first of all, journalistic integrity isn't what it used to be. I mean, come on, a few of them said positive things about the show Velma. Second, what is this headline? Heroic teen mom makes cousins look like garbage? What does this have to do with cousins? And second, Velma has never done anything heroic. Norville agrees to publish the paper because he's a simp, but he tries to get Velma to at least change the baby's diaper once. So she goes to his dad so he can change the diaper. But then she finds a welding 
wearing mask in his office. Okay, so Norville's dad isn't actually the serial killer, and I complained a lot in my video how I fell out of love with Marvel about how Disney would build up this POC or female villain only to shoehorn in a white guy as the true villain out of nowhere. But if Norvell's dad was actually the serial killer, despite him being a white man, I think that would have been a pretty good twist. For how much he's treated like shit by everyone, he has the motive. And a pushover school counselor secretly being a serial killer would be very interesting. So Velma, upon suspecting that her best friend's dad is the serial killer, decides to act all smug about it, not talk to Norvell about it, and call the police on him. For some reason, the police believed Velma, even though we were shown only two episodes ago that people will only listen to her if she had male privilege. It turns out that Norvell's dad only had a welding mask so he could make his son a sword for his birthday. Even a tank shows up. Velma's only evidence was a welding mask and they brought this much firepower. Our tax dollars at work, ladies and gentlemen. Norvell and his family have been nothing but nice to Velma and she accuses Norvell's father of murder and destroys his house. Mindy Kelly truly has made herself insert into the worst person ever. Now that Fred and Daphne are now popular again, Daphne gets invited to the Brains party and she decides that she's no longer gonna be with Fred and go with Velma. Even though Velma saved the Brains, which would make them like her, in turn making her popular! Just saying, if white people are now the minorities on campus... <laughs> Wait, what the hell was that? Fred's mom is interested in giving Daphne a job at her company, and it's revealed that Fred's dad is spying on them, and he's very unhappy with his wife's actions. This is unbelievable. I put you above everything in my life, but I draw the line at my family. So Norvell finally stands up to Velma, and he will finally stop simping for her. I don't know why he put her on such a high pedestal in the first place, but now he's finally stopping. And Velma loses the baby again, causing a whole bunch of cars to crash. The brains try to get Daphne and Fred to prove that they're actually in love with one another by kissing each other. But they're both attractive people, so this is really easy for them. All the brains can do is think, but what were they thinking? They were dating at the start of the series. But Velma sees them kissing, and then her parents walk in as well. And her mother finally gets all of her memories back. You did have an affair, Amon, while I was kidnapped. Oh my god, shut up! Velma's mom remembers who the serial killer is, and she says it, but then she's cut off by the credits. Wow, that would be a good cliffhanger if episode 9 and 10 didn't come out on the same day. I'm joking, of course it's worse than that, because she reveals that she's the serial killer at the end of the credits. So that was episode 9, still not as bad as episode 7, but it was a chore to get through. I just got one more episode to go through, episode 10, the finale. So if there's one thing that the finale for Mandalorian Season 3 in Ahsoka has taught me, is that the finale for a terrible show is probably gonna be the worst episode out of all of them. I did it because I wanted to put the brain of a popular girl into the head of my daughter Velma. What? What the fuck? And if there's one thing Velma has been up to this point, it's certainly a terrible show. It turned out my mom wasn't kidnapped by the serial killer. Apparently, she was the serial killer. Yeah, and worse than that, she gave birth to you. This may be a bit of a radical opinion, but I think we should start putting people who make terrible shows on trial. The cop runs over Velma's foot because the cop is incredibly based. Velma is trying to figure out why her mom would try to recreate the work of a mad scientist. You know, since Velma's mom was just removing brains and keeping them alive, that would mean even if her mom was the serial killer, she still wouldn't be a serial killer because she's not killing anyone. The police are trying to auction off Velma's mom's stuff because she was one of America's only female serial killers. And to be fair, that is true. Very few serial killers are women. And I don't mean to sound sexist, but men are just so much better at mass murdering than women. <laughs> Ladies, if you want to take someone out, ask your man to do it. Norvell gets an own on Velma, but then Daphne just has to come in and be defensive of Velma. Even though Velma has also been extremely horrible towards her. I'm not joking, literally after Daphne tells Norvell that they need to be here for her, Velma tries to attack her because she kissed Fred, even though Velma was no longer into Fred. Daphne pins Velma to the ground and, oh my god, I think I just found the thumbnail for this video. 
I did it because I wanted to put the brain of a popular girl into the head of my daughter, Velma. I mean, can you really blame her? If I had Velma for a daughter, I would probably do the same. But the only way Carl Kearns let you anywhere near your mom's cell is if you get arrested yourself. The only thing he'd arrest you for right now is murder. Oh, that's easy. All Velma has to do is show someone her face. But in all seriousness, the cops literally just told her she'll only get arrested for murder. So she can do whatever she wants as long as it's not murder. Anyone would take advantage of that! I really hope this is the last time I'll have to say this, but the writers of She-Hulk knew more about law than the writers of Velma. Though I married into this company, I'm the one who built it from a small Ascot shop into the multi-billion dollar target of child labor lawsuits it is today. Okay, while it is totally possible for a woman to become a billionaire, the overwhelming majority of billionaires are men. And the overwhelming majority of homeless people are also men. Look up the richest women in the world. They either inherited their wealth or got it through divorce. For example, Jeff Bezos' ex-wife. Like, I know they're trying to push the whole behind every great man is a great woman, but you need to take the good with the bad, like Ronald Reagan and Benedict Arnold. I'm raging out because my mom doesn't think I'm capable of running the family business. And now Fred's mom is incredibly based. We get the origin of why the mystery van has flowers painted on it. Like, did anyone actually care about this? Velma uses Fred to get herself arrested. But would you arrest her if someone like me said someone like her was bothering him? Well, yeah, that would do it. Ah, yes, Fred used his white privilege to get her arrested. Even though if a woman said a man was bothering her, the man would be far more likely to get arrested, but whatever. Norvell is now based because he's no longer simping for Velma. It only took her making him lose out on a million dollars, accusing his father of being the serial killer, and several years of her using him to get him to finally drop her. Daphne gets a note and a necklace from her mother, who managed to get away from the serial killer. Velma figures out that her mother was hypnotized, but before she can snap her fingers to break her out of the hypnosis, even though people snap their fingers all the time, the police take Velma's mother away before Velma is able to do it. Daphne visits Velma and suddenly the necklace has a pocket watch on it. It wasn't there before, it just suddenly appeared. Velma has another hallucination and she learns how she was hypnotized two years ago when her mother went missing. Wait, what? This happened two years ago? Man, Velma sure had a growth spurt. I swear for the longest time I thought this happened five years ago. Boy, was I wrong. It turns out that Velma's hallucinations throughout the series were caused by the serial killer hypnotizing her. Whenever she tried to figure out what happened to her mom, she would experience hallucinations. Even though for the last couple of episodes she has been trying to figure out what happened to her mom, and she wasn't experiencing hallucinations. This latest hallucination literally just explained to her how she was hypnotized. Once again, she didn't figure out something on her own. She was just given the information. The watch even has the name of the general guy. Velma didn't have to figure that out for herself. The name was just given to her. Daphne and Velma share a tender moment, even though Velma's mom is being driven towards death row right now. Daphne leaves in a limo to meet up with Fred, and Fred's father is spying on her. Then we cut to 15-year-old girls showering together, and oh, uh, editor, do a good job at censoring this. Emma enters the shower and she's also naked. Oh god, my eyes. We learn that Norvell is transferring schools because he can't stand to be around Velma, and honestly, I can't blame him. Norvell is absolutely ecstatic to see his new school because it doesn't have Velma. Yeah, I know he's really into fencing, but let's be honest here, the real reason why he's so excited to go to it is because Velma's not there. Velma finally listens to all of Norvell's voicemails while the song from the Sad Puppy commercial plays. And as she's listening to them, she gets so happy. Even though a normal person would be sad that they lost such a good friend. But I guess she's happy that he simped for her so hard despite all the horrible ways she's treated him. Eventually, she gets to the first voicemail he ever left her, which was about how he liked her glasses. 
So she checks the logo on the glasses that she has constantly put on for the last two years and realizes that it's made by Fred's family's company. So yeah, Velma had to have a clue pointed out to her yet again. If he never transferred schools, she would have never listened to his messages. And if she never listened to his messages, she would have never found the clue that was literally on her face! Velma looks at a picture of Fred's father. She realizes he has the same logo on his jacket and on his pocket watch, which is the same pocket watch she has. I mean, she could have looked at the picture of Fred's dad after she got the pocket watch. Hey Velma, here's a pocket watch that my mom gave me. Ugh, oh, thanks Daphne, I think I've seen this pocket watch before. Velma just constantly has clues fall in her lap and she doesn't even need half of them. Velma and her dad go to Fred's mansion. For some reason, they sneak over the wall instead of going through the front gate. Velma's dad was their son's lawyer. They probably would have let him in. Apparently, her dad believing her counteracted the hypnotism because the hypnotist said that she was a weirdo who no one would believe. When in reality, the writers were just making up how Velma's hallucinations worked on the spot. But the one good writer on the team managed to fill up this plot hole. Velma gets over to the wall and sneaks into the lab through the secret end entrance down the well, and her dad goes off to call the police while his POC daughter is breaking into a rich guy's home. I guess he just really wants to get his daughter arrested, and honestly, I can't blame him. As Velma is going down the well, she calls Norvell and tells him that she loves him. Yeah, it's because he stopped simping for her. Velma just likes guys who treat her like shit. She falls down the well as she screams, don't donate my body to science. Yeah, even in death, Velma doesn't want to give anything back to the world. Velma finds Fred and Daphne, along with the serial killer. Velma loses her glasses, and we get a ha ha. I hope this doesn't keep happening. Ha ha, get it? It's another Scooby Doo reference. But the serial killer hears Velma and goes to kill her. And somehow, despite Velma being as blind as a bat, is able to sneak past the serial killer. Well, you got me. By all accounts, it doesn't make sense. Velma manages to take out the serial killer with the perfume, which apparently attracts bats. Oh, and the bats also apparently really like Fred as well. Nice. Velma figures out that the serial killer was trying to frame her. It clearly didn't work because the police never suspected Velma of being the serial killer. Because everybody's an idiot in this show. It turns out that the serial killer is John Cena! I'm joking, it's Fred's mom. And I'll give the show credit for one thing. I did not see this coming! And I'll also give it credit for making the villain a woman. With how rare it is for people with 2X chromosomes to be the villains nowadays, it's no wonder why I didn't see it coming. Okay, so Fred's mom's plan was to swap Daphne and Fred's brain. Because Fred is completely incompetent, which is partially her fault since she raised him. Also, apparently, she's the daughter of the general who did Project Scooby. Her father tried to take credit for, uh, Dr. Perdue's work. And Dr. Perdue, not wanting a man to take credit for her work, destroyed it. And Velma's mom found Dr. Perdue's journals. So Fred's mom hypnotized hypnotized her into rebuilding the lab. Okay, but why pick the brain of a hot popular girl? We're literally the only murders people care about. Because I wanted someone like me. An ambitious, status-conscious young woman who could appreciate what she might achieve as the male president of a global corporation. Yep, this is all about male privilege. Apparently, if a hot girl's brain was put into a male's body, she could do anything. Like, I should be more angry and complain about this more, but this is so cartoonishly on the nose. But now I see the perfect brain for Fred is the one I tried hardest to keep away. Um, she means perfectly terrible, right? Because Velma literally had all the clues for this mystery given to her. Fred's dad shows up and he's hypnotized. Velma can tell because of the eyes, even though neither her nor her mom's eyes changed when they were hypnotized, but uh, the writers just don't care about their own rules. I have no choice. The poor fool figured out what I was up to. How? Because he saw you talking to Daphne? Victoria, think this through. Once my brain is in Fred, I'll just go to the police right after I've looked at myself naked. No, you won't, Velma, because not only are you Brilliant. Who more than you would truly appreciate the advantages of being a handsome, rich, 
fight man. Okay, first of all, Velma isn't brilliant. I explained enough already how she had other people solve the mystery for her. But even if she was brilliant, she has no idea on how to run a company. Also considering that Velma is Mindy Kelly self-insert, does Mindy Kelly just want to be a white man? Mindy Kelly, you're already one of the most privileged people in the world. I mean, after all, you made this show and people didn't literally crucify you for it. Uh, advantages? You think we like being president of the United States 97% of the time? Which is a job you have to be voted in for. And people will literally vote for Trump over a woman. I'm joking, of course. That wasn't a woman, that was Hillary. And she did get the popular vote. But in all seriousness, less than 50 men throughout all American history were president. Sure, the most powerful people tend to be men. Most billionaires, all presidents, and so on. But men also take up the majority of the lowest positions in society. 80% of homeless people are men. The overwhelming majority of prisoners are men. And absolutely lowest of all, most YouTubers are men. But why is that? It's almost like men are more biologically prone to take risks. Having spent time with the brains, I was reminded that hot popular girls your age don't yet realize just how much the deck is stacked against them. Ah yes, no one has the deck stacked up against them more than hot girls. Especially the ones who make millions of dollars off of OnlyFans. Velma talks about how privileged Fred is, even though he's about to be murdered. This pisses off Fred and he gets a rage boost. He wrestles the gun away from his dad. Fred's mom makes a run for it, and Fred saves Velma. So are the writers trying to tell us that rich white guys suck, but they will also save the day? Also, I'm gonna be real here, Fred is the only one with character development. Fred is about to take out his mother. Oh, he looks so badass. But then she of course tricks him by saying that she was possessed by the ghost of Dr. Predadu. You know, Fred, she may have a gun, but she still needs your body, so uh, she's not gonna shoot you. Daphne simps for Velma super hard and they kiss. But Velma only likes people who treat her like garbage, so she says, I love you, Norvell. But then Norvell shows up. Fred's mom shoots at him, and he deflects the bullet with his sword? Wow, uh, Norvell quickly became the best character. He even knocked it into a stalactite that falls on Fred's mom. Velma twerks while covered in blood. Um, I don't know what to say. It's over. It's finally over. I know, right? I'm finally done reviewing this show. Oh no, wait, I still have a few more minutes to go. Velma and her friends are rewarded with the keys to the city, and then they immediately start fighting with each other. Velma watches a horror show with her mom after she locked her dad, his new wife, and their baby outside. Because Velma just can't stop being a horrible person. Norvell is really disturbed that he killed Fred's mom, and his dad tells him to, uh try some marijuana. Oh my god, in my first Velma video, I was right. At the end of the series, Norvell the Black Shaggy did like drugs. And finally, they try to set up a second season, which still hasn't happened and probably never will happen. And then the episode finally ends. Holy crap, yeah, that was a really bad finale. But it still wasn't as bad as episode 7. Anyways, it's now time that I move on to my ending thoughts. Wow, just wow, it took a while, but I got through the entire series of Velma. Unless, of course, they make a season 2, which I heard they're actually not doing. I mean, after all, the series has been out for a year, and by now there would be a trailer, but as far as I can see, there isn't. But is this really the worst series I've ever reviewed? Well, I'll give it credit for one thing, it did make me laugh a handful of times, which is certainly more than I can say for She-Hulk. And it didn't piss me off as much as a lot of more Marvel and Star Wars shows did. They fly now! So after looking over it a year after it came out, now that the hatred for it has died down, is it really the worst show ever made? Yes! Keep in mind, I'm not connected to Scooby-Doo in the same way I'm connected to Star Wars and Marvel. And being funnier than She-Hulk is a very low bar to jump over. There's also like three times the jokes in this show than there is in She-Hulk, so a few of them just had to land. You'll also find people who defend She-Hulk, The Last Jedi, Ahsoka, Kenobi, and even Mandalorian Season 3. But the only people I've seen defend this show are doing it ironically. When even the people you're trying to pander 
or two don't like it, you know you made a bad show. This show didn't piss me off nearly as much as other shows did, and at times it goes into so bad it's good territory. But I can tell that when it comes to writing, character work, pacing, and everything else, it truly is the worst show ever made. But its insults towards white men are so over the top that it didn't even get that much of a reaction out of me. This show even failed at pissing me off, and that was the main thing it set out to do. Now, there are still plenty of bad shows out there that I haven't fully reviewed, like Echo, Season 2 of Loki, Secret Invasion, and more. But at least I think I got the absolute worst one out of the way. But, uh, I really need a break from working on long videos. So the next handful of videos are going to be 15 to 30 minutes long, and I'm also going to be uploading videos on my other channels now. I already uploaded a new video on my channel, Fast Fictional Fights, where I power scale all the hand-drawn Disney movies. I really hope this video does well because my last four videos haven't done so hot. Anyways, my next video will be a defense of AI art because I want to get cancelled. See you guys then. My Patreon supporter, Odd Emerald Zone, wanted me to say, and out of the darkness, a zombie did call. True pain and suffering he brought to them all. Waver the children to hide in their beds for fear that the devil would chop off their heads. If you would like me to say something at the end of one of my videos, please donate $5 a month to me on Patreon. Alright, now let's get to the credits.